what so what version do you normally use? ESV. Yeah. But I'd normally read LSB. Okay. Which I think came out a year ago. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. Um, wait, so why the, why the discrepancy there? Between which one I use normally and read? Not like a negative discrepancy, yeah. but why the difference? Um, been reading the ESV since I've become a believer. Yeah. And wanted to check out the LSB. Okay. So what are your thoughts on it? Compared, like, compared to like ESV. Yeah. Um, so I've read three Bible prefaces, ESV, CSB, LSB. Interesting. And I, okay. I loved the um, preface and the goal of we're trying to translate the text, not interpret it. Mm. Interpretation ought to be left to the church. Yeah. Yeah. I just like yeah. the philosophy. Yeah. I mean, it is impossible to translate without some interpretation. Correct. But I, I would assume they acknowledge that in the preface. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, just like their translation philosophy. Like the um, example I like to use for the idea that you just conveyed. Um, I lived in the Netherlands for a year, so mm-hmm. I know some Dutch. Uh, I was talking to Judith a little bit. Oh, The only yeah. two phrases I can say well is that I don't know much Dutch, and what do you think of double predestination? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only, everything else I basically forgot. In but. the Dutch reform world, I think that's the most important question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me do a quick introduction for you. Sure. Uh, Nick Kellogg, former world champion video game player, um, married with six kids, Mm -hmm. homeschooler and possible advocate, I would assume. We'll get to that. I'm a general fan, yeah. Yeah, general fan. Um, Reader of the Puritans, or Mm -hmm. at least they were... If not presently, they were part of your conversion story, which we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Um, jiu-jitsu practitioner. Moderate. Yeah. That's fair. I'm, I've am i done a little bit. We'll get to that. Sure. Um, and uh, student, and you said lecture at PRTS. Mm-hmm. Although, to be fair, it's a discussion-based class, so I don't stand up and lecture. But Well, hey, man, that's like, the format in the UK where I did my postgraduate work. Okay. And that is the best way to teach. I agree. That's my opinion. Just trying to clarify. Yeah. Lecturing is, well, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Sure. Um, and you are a biblical counselor. Mm-hmm. Did I miss anything? I've missed a lot. I'm sure that, that you okay. didn't tell me, but we'll get to some of those sure. things. Okay. Uh, welcome to the show, man. Yeah. Thank you. Really good to have you here. Oh, and Pretty the man good. who doesn't smile unless he really wants to. Correct. Although I could leave yeah. out the really, but unless he wants to. Yeah. Although yeah. I think uh, I'm not sure how many of us choose to smile and then smile. I just don't decide I want to smile and I think then try we, to smile. I think a lot of us have been conditioned to react a certain way to certain social stimuli. Okay. I would agree. Yeah. It's like my dog. <laughs> sure. No, I'm serious. I believe the, dog, the door opens. Yeah. For my wife's, uh, she's a osteopath. But there's one door in the house that when that door clicks open, he knows and he starts barking. As much as we try to train him. And we've worked, we're getting him better. But any other door in the house, same lock, same handle, doesn't bark. Uh, can I ask why? Why he barks at that? Because yeah. he knows that a person is coming into the home. Okay. And he knows they come through that door. People who aren't normally there. That's good. Yeah. So. What kind of dog? He, uh, he's a Cavachon. I should say he's not my dog because I don't want to claim a Cavachon as mine. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that is. A so. Cavachon's a little white dog, kind of like small to medium size. Sure. Um, my guess was little. Otherwise, you'd want to claim it. I would claim it if it was a big dog. Yeah. I'm like a Mastiff, uh, Labrador, gotcha. everything in between we- guy had a Doberman for a year okay. and that was the only qualification I had was it needed to be more like a dog than a cat. Wait. When my family, everyone wanted a dog but me. Oh, the pet needed to be more dog than cat? Yes. Oh, I wouldn't get okay. a dog that looked like a cat. Oh, good. That was smart. The, turns Dude. out that it was too big for our family, so we got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> it went to the farm. <laughs> well, um, I'm just kidding. It went back to the breeder. <laughs> I, uh, let's talk more about dogs in a minute, but what sure. I want to do first is 
as a way of saying thanks. We've just started doing this. So um, you and Brooks Buser, who was on last week, uh, are going to make the rest of our previous guests jealous because we're now doing gifts. And oh, nice. um, there's a little something for you, man. Great. Am I good to open it? Oh, yeah, you should. Definitely. All right. So starting with some John Owen coffee. Don't yeah. know if you know it. Favorite author. Okay, good. Let's we're talking about Owen. Number the. I don't know if that's an espresso roast, and you are an espresso guy, which we talked about before. Yeah, this but recording. I, I drink. Um, we do black and tan in our espresso, so it's dark okay. and light roast. Yeah, yeah. But nice. Thank you. Habitual side of him, has not. Okay. Cool. Good. I'm I'm really happy to give people things they haven't read yet. Yeah. Yeah. This well, is one of uh, Joel B. If not his favorite, Puritan. Yeah. He is on my list. Yeah. This is a good inter- the good way to like get into it because Joel B. Mm-hmm. I should say the Reverend Doctor Joel B. But he uh, gives a really helpful introduction in this small little booklet okay. that is selections from Goodwin, and then as. As Joel has told me himself, and I think he said it elsewhere, but when he was first introduced to Goodwin back at the age of, I think, 17, it became this life goal of his to publish the works of Goodwin, hmm. which was recently done by RHB. Oh, so wow. that's cool. It's a kind of an exciting thing for us at RHB. Yeah. Um, uh, at the risk of being embarrassed, is he the guy that also wrote the uh, the heart of Christ in heaven towards sinners who are on earth? That. Do you so know Abby? Else? The heart of Christ in heaven. Yeah, I believe. So you're embarrassing me now because I don't know. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. I think it was the one that the um, good and lowly or gentle and lowly book was patterned after. But Is I that thought true? It was Thomas Goodwin. Okay. Okay. Great. So I did read most of that book. So gentle and lowly was patterned after a Goodwin yep. work. Yep. Oh, interesting. I think I started reading it and then heard an interview where he said that, and then decided. I'm not going to read this one anymore. I'm just going to pick up a good one and read that. But I totally forgot if it was him. That's what you decided. Yeah. Oh, that was a good good course of action. I agree. He yeah. said, I mean, in the interview, he says that uh, I don't, this isn't a quote, but it's the idea that his was a knockoff of the original. I'm like, well, I'll just read the original. <laughs> With the Puritans, I think that's a really good way to go. Mm-hmm. Even if you have to struggle a bit more through it. Sure. I agree. It's like doing karate versus jujitsu. See, I made him smile. <laughs> I do. I do smile a good amount. I just don't do it. But you've already seen the. Uh, sorry, it might be. You've already seen the extent of my emotional expression. Which is you can I. do as much or as little emotional expression as you want to. This. I'm assuming it's a DVD film. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's the revival documentary, okay. Um, which we recently a year ago released. But yeah, there it is a DVD. If you don't have a DVD player, like a lot of people these days, then uh, there is a, a code in there to do streaming. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Do you actually have a DVD player? Although I don't think our kids know what it is. <laughs> which is all right. <laughs> Nice. That's, Thank you very much. Yeah, and then just two more books. The Law and the Gospel, this is mm-hmm. a, an author, John Calhoun, not known hardly at all, actually, within the reform world, but except by those who know. Sure. But uh, we're, we've re, we're reprinting this in that cover, designed by Jeff Trojek. He's, he's a fantastic designer. He did the design for Revival as well. And um, this is basically how do you reconcile what, the scriptures say about law and gospel mm-hmm. without um, negating either and still upholding the the goodness and the graciousness and the justice of God. Nice. And then the last one is uh, Paul Washer's latest. I think it's his, I'm pretty sure it's his latest, but we just published this. It's uh, The Preeminent Christ. I was just talking about him Saturday. Paul yeah? Yep. Not to him, about him. To whom? A uh, number of elders at our church. Mm-hmm. Someone brought up the shocking youth message that he preached. Oh, from no years one, ago? Yeah, but no one had heard of it. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I thought that was kind of like, 
ubiquitous knowledge. Yeah, should be. Like when you become a Christian, you should have to watch that before you get baptized. I know that, that watching that video is is was kind of a catalyst for me to go into seminary. Really? Yeah. I was just really convicted by it, and you you can leave your toothpick there. So. Okay, thank you. I had actually gotten this one out to give to you because oh. you gave me some stuff. Thanks, man. Which was, uh, are we going to chew toothpicks on the show? Uh, you told me I could. Oh, man, these are so good. Do you want one? You don't have to. Don't okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. When I was in, um, this is going to make me sound silly, but that's okay. Um, or cool. When I was in seminary in Los Angeles at Master Seminary, okay. I worked, uh, I'd gone from working commercial real estate as a uh, junior broker under my dad. And, um, I got a job at Whole Foods Market mm -hmm. down the street from us. And I worked in the um, the whole body section. I have no, I've never, uh, I think I've been in Whole Foods. Come on, man, you can admit it. <laughs> I live in, there, I, don't know, I don't even know if there's one in Kalamazoo. Okay, we have one right across the street here. Yeah, which just came in. But um, the whole body section deals with like um, herbs, probiotics, Oh, okay. Body washes. Gotcha. So think, thankfully I wasn't assigned body washes and I became like the herb expert and I had to do all this training. It was actually pretty cool. But um, we sold these toothpicks and I, I lived on these. So this brings back good memories because I actually nice. haven't seen these in a long time. So after the show, I think I'm going to go get a box of them. Sure. I get them <laughs> on Amazon just because they're cheap. But oh, yeah. It's also funny you mentioned the body wash. My uh -huh. brother-in-law is a... Uh, somewhere in the marketing team at Procter & Gamble, and he is doing body wash with Meyer. That's his job really? is to help them structure their shelves. Yeah. Do you get free bottles? No. Well, I've never asked. Yeah, you probably could. Probably. All the samples. I also would actually really like to ask you about the being a junior broker because I think that's could be related to something I'm trying to do with our kids. But okay. Do you mean after the show or right now? I don't care. Uh, I, I don't care either. I'm happy okay. to talk about anything. Okay. So we were trying to change the format on the show. Mm -hmm. This is for our listeners as well, so you guys know. Previous to this, it's been all kind of like Joe Rogan style of just free-flowing conversation. And then I, as you can see on my notes, I have just bullet points. Sure. There's no questions listed. I just want to, I'm just interested in who you are. And I've told every guest, it's like, hey, look, it's not a one-way interview. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are used to that, especially, let's say, more um, people who have more notoriety, who are used to being interviewed. They're Classic. used to sitting and waiting easy. for a question. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, no. Like, feel free to ask me questions too, you know? Not mm -hmm. that I care to talk about myself much, but um, it makes it more of a conversation. Sure. So uh, what do you want to know about? brokerage uh how did more about what it is i have a general idea but um how, how did it work being one a junior you said a junior broker under your dad oh that's a good question hold on let me point this out yeah. oh sure you're good because um my hope is that by the time each of our kids leave our house that they can be working um uh, trying to start i don't know like a rental company i guess mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i want each of our kids I would like the ability for each of our kids to work for it and not need another job by the time they leave our house. That's a goal that I have. Mm. But yeah, yeah. That what you're talking about is uh, connected, and I like to learn. Like it's related, right, to real estate? Yeah, yeah. That's actually a good question. And actually, the better example wouldn't be my dad and I. Okay. But that there's some principles to mm -hmm. to get out of that but it would be um my uncle okay and his kids well so let's start with me and my dad so sure. i went to the naval academy after high school i was going to do marine corps rotc but i ended up getting a uh, a place at the academy because mm -hmm. all i wanted to do is either be marine corps force recon or, or navy seal that's all i wanted to do with my life so i went to the academy uh ended up needing a pretty Drastic surgery. I told Brooks a little bit about this on Friday, right, Abby? Mm -hmm. 
Just barely. Anyway, it's it was a vascular surgery. So they're like, okay. there's no way you're going into combat. If you get, if you nick barbed wire running across the field, you could bleed out. Because I have arteries now directly under my skin, in my legs. So that uh, put a big X through the Navy sure. SEAL dream. And I had a Graduated and I came home instead of doing my obligatory service. Mm -hmm. So I ended up working in commercial real estate because my dad had been in it for years and my uncle as well and just started having lunch with guys. And um, it wasn't like nepotism. It was just, here's a list of all the people I know. Go mm -hmm. make phone calls. Like my dad and my uncle knew how to do it right. Sure. It wasn't like, hey, Johnny, can you give my son a job? It gotcha. was none of that. It was like, you go do the work and you go find a job. And we're going to give you a little bit of help by, you know, giving you the numbers of people mm -hmm. we know, which was awesome. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure how you would define nepotism, but I want my kids working for me. I don't know if that counts. I'm not saying nepotism is bad, and I okay. would actually never say that. And okay. I think the best, some of the best things in life can can be in our nepoti, nepoti, nepotistic. <laughs> <laughs> let's look that one up <sighs> okay that's um right. it it depends like, like it normally has a negative connotation but it yeah. normally does but i think it's because what people don't realize is that the power of networks mm -hmm. is relies upon one thing and it's trust if you can't trust people mm -hmm. why would you hire them sure if you don't know who they are if you have no idea about their background mm -hmm. why would you entrust them see there it is entrust them with things that are going to impact your bottom line as a business person, mm -hmm. your ministry as a pastor, um, your family life as a as a husband and a father. Why would you hire somebody as a right. to like babysit your kids that mm -hmm. you didn't know somebody who knew them who could attest to whatever? Sure. So anyway, that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah. And, and with nepotism too, I think this. I know we're. We can talk about whatever, we can talk about whatever we want yeah. to. With nepotism too, I think it's um, it's there's a certain level of uh, what do we call it? Investment that the person has in you, and whether it's your business or your family mm -hmm. or your ministry, because because of those relational ties of family. Mm -hmm. So some nepotism is bad, but it but it's actually what the nepotism is being used to accomplish. Sure. Right? Yeah, I think... Like uh, crooked deals with foreign entities, and I won't yeah. explain what I'm talking about, but... Sure. Right. That's bad. Yep. That's bad nepotism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just um, similar idea, but yeah, I think I don't... I think we overvalue the idea of being unbiased in our society. Like I should have a bias towards my kids. You absolutely should have right. a bias towards your children. Right. But yeah. that... Generally, like people pause a little bit to think about it because we're yeah. so used to wanting to be unbiased. Yeah, and they throw that example. That's uh, what is it? Not that example, but that kind of like riddle of you're uh, you're a train station. Oh yeah, the man, trolley car. Problem. The trolley car problem. So do you switch the tracks to save a hundred people on the trolley, uh, or do you switch the tracks? Oh, do you switch the tracks? And the hundred people in the trolley are saved, but your son who's stuck on the tracks dies. He gets run over. Or do you switch it the other way and your son lives, but the trolley plunges off a bridge and kills all hundred people. Right? Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. Most people will never be in that situation, but <laughs> yeah, it is Especially like today. Just, <laughs> like, just don't really have trolleys. Yeah, I've never seen a trolley. <laughs> Um, okay, so back to your question. Sure. I'm getting around to it in a long way. Um, my uncle, oh, and I ended up working for my dad eventually because mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was right before seminary just because I had been working in Hollywood for like, what was that, a decade by then? Oh, cool. I was that doing film? Type doing stuff? film and TV. So okay. originally kind of like in front of the camera stuff, and then I got tired of all the rejection, and I started screenwriting which I still do today and then uh, on the side. But um, that that felt good. It felt good to like take control mm -hmm. and not to downplay any actors because I have some friends who are still in the business, but um, acting is much more, much more interpretation, whereas screenwriting is creation. Okay. So you're building, 
it's ex nihilo. You're building something from mm -hmm. nothing. It's not completely ex nihilo because you're actually building out of all of your background sure. and your imagination and the, the stuff, the material that's mm -hmm. in there and in here. Mm -hmm. I'm pointing to my heart for those who are listening and my head. But um, for acting, and again, I have huge respect for the craft because I don't think I was a good actor. But you're you're taking it because actually it's actually very hard to take what someone else has made and then interpret it in a way that's believable and uh enjoyable mm -hmm. yeah so anyway um then i went back to work for my dad uh directly as his junior broker and we were but we were in commercial real estate so we were selling sure. big high-rise office buildings and that's a very different thing than I think what you're talking about, which Correct. is more residential, Yep. whether it's land or um, duplexes or single family homes. So, but my uncle, he and his boys, his sons and his daughters mm -hmm. um, have created quite a business for themselves in Southern California. I won't give too many details because they might not want me sure. to, but they started just with a few I think even just one property and they've slowly built it to, I don't know what it is now, hundreds of units and single family homes throughout Southern California that they, uh, they set up a trust. And of course my uncle is the, the main guy mm -hmm. and he has a, at least one or two business partners, all, all believers. And then um, his sons, one went to law school and does all the legal. Oh, nice. And the other one um, got a business degree and um, at Pepperdine, and he handles, he pretty much kind of does most of the oversight of everything. Okay. And it's worked out really, really well for them. Mm -hmm. For some families, it wouldn't work. There'd be infighting, there'd sure. be the bad nepotism. Mm -hmm. This is good nepotism. This is good nepotism based upon their shared identity in Christ, yep. to put it simply. Nice. Yeah. And, I, and I would love to do that for my kids. That's if what I, I want to do too. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, my wife's coming along. She, we were just talking about last night. She she's says it on board. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, she's definitely had more of like a more bought into the traditional approach to education, uh, which she's slowly walk, moving away from. But yeah, it was super ingrained growing up. Uh, she's actually, actually, I think this is kind of funny. Funny is probably the wrong word, but she's uh, from Ukraine and Jewish. And so I like to say she's had a bit rough two years, or three years, whatever it is. <laughs> but um, in certain. Yeah, I shouldn't be laughing, but that is, yeah. uh, well, we were talking about Norm MacDonald before yeah. the show started rolling. So sure. I'm sh I could see Norm making a joke out of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was trying to, but yeah. <laughs> um, but with her grandparents, um, yeah, they were, which kind of raised her, but really, um, who are, grew up in the USSR, uh, really prioritized education, get a good career. If mm -hmm. you get a good education, get a good career in America, you can just pay people to do everything else for you. Hmm. That was kind of drilled into her. Um, yeah. and I think I prefer, uh, I don't know if non-traditional is the right word. I don't like doing the norm just because it's the norm on it think about things more so. Um, which actually ties into the uh, ELCA thing on there. Just um, growing up. Checking out my notes. Yeah, sorry. Am I allowed to? Well, it's fine. If you can read upside okay. down, you have full liberty to do that. So. Moderately. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're, uh, yeah, growing up uh, relatively liberal Lutheran church. And I would start to ask questions about why do we do things this way? Why do we not do this? Explain the ELS ELGA. Um, I, what does the acronym stand for? Yeah, for uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Okay. Split with the Missouri Synod, where mm -hmm. I think the theological conservatives went with the Missouri Synod, theological liberals went with the ELCA. Okay. I grew up in the ELCA. Yeah. Um, where the answer was always, we do these things because we're Lutheran. Mm. Which even in elementary school, my question was, so if I'm not a Lutheran, can I just not do these things? Like, I don't understand. Uh, but... The connection there is that after I became a believer, um, I think it's Matthew 15, the you've made void the words of God for the sake of your tradition, mm -hmm. uh, was like the first verse I remember like, oh, I can actually see how this plays out 
in the world around me. Yeah. Um, and I think that gave me a bad taste for tradition for the sake of tradition. Mm. Mm. And so, it, uh, um, would you say you were a yeah. believer at that time? Mm, no, I would not. Yeah. I'd, yeah. No. So you were questioning not the theological accuracy of things, but rather the logic behind behaviors and mm -hmm. ritual. And yeah. Belief. I mean, I don't, I don't think we ever got into any theology behind anything at mm -hmm. that church. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, you know, generally true of more liberal churches. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of, I mean, they're, um, trying to think how to say it well, they're generally more, uh, humanists, if I could mm -hmm. try to say that nicely, but to a point where, um, at one point I was trying to support Ray's for a year long commitment to be a missionary in the Netherlands. And I had, uh, I believe two families at that church tell me if I'm going to share the gospel and try to convert people, they won't support me. Wow. If I'm going to go there and do something else, they will. Okay. But I have a hard time understanding what's meant by Christian or church at that point with that yeah. view. Yeah. We have a lot of churches here in Grand Rapids <laughs> that Correct. are that are very happy to uh, display the rainbow flag. Yep and Black Lives Matter signs and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like they want you very, they want very much to know who's allowed in and who's not. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so my kids are like, Dad, why are they doing that? <laughs> but the connection, though, was that, um, so I think, yeah, even like school. Like, I, I don't know. I don't want just, I don't want to just send our kids to college because that's yeah. the normal thing to do. Yeah, yeah want to think about is there something that would be better to do yeah did you come through that kind of a traditional pr uh process like with education yeah yeah my dad worked at uh western michigan uh-huh so from a young age i knew that's where i was going okay. i knew i could get the grades to go in yeah i knew it was going to be cheap regardless of how well i did in yeah. school yeah so it was pretty what did you study um, biomedical sciences. Okay. Wanted to be a doctor uh, as long as I can remember. Okay. I think I would attribute it at least to I grew up watching ER with my parents <laughs> and the West Wing. And I guess I'm glad I wanted to be a doctor, not a politician. But. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's take it back a bit. Sure. We, we've covered the ELGA. You grew up here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sorry. It is CA. I might have mistyped it. I'm, I might have miswrote it. Either way, with my talking about doctors, my doctor handwriting. Sure, but see, yeah. I'm really amazed you can read it. So ELCA, okay. Um, you you also mentioned that you were a video game player and Correct. champion. Kind of connected, actually. Yeah. Really. Yeah. To your Lutheran church experience. Yeah. Okay. So how are they? How connected. are those connected? Sure. Um, uh, so I think in middle school was the first time uh, that I, there was a pattern that I'd started to recognize in high school that um, growing up I was told, do your best. Doesn't matter how well you do, just do your best. Turns out uh, I could do my best and it actually would, would not be good enough. What's an example? Yeah, so in middle school um, I took the ACT yeah. going into sixth grade, scored well enough, that going into seventh grade, I went to Western Michigan and took Calc 2. Uh, neither of my parents had ever gone through algebra. And so I was told, uh, so I guess to back up, uh, I think my parents saw that as a really great opportunity, that in sixth grade I'm getting college credit. They were the first ones in their families, well, first generation in their families to go to college. Mm -hmm. And I don't think had a lot of support from their parents with okay. college. Yeah. Um, both worked their way through. Um, yeah, it's not like they were told don't go. There just wasn't much help. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think they saw it as a good opportunity, but, um, uh, in light of that, I had a rule that unless I was going to soccer practice, I had to sit at the dining room table until I got my homework done. 
but for three months I never got my homework done. And then eventually I failed all the classes. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my first time realizing that uh, doing my best sometimes is not going to be good enough. Hold on, I don't understand. Yep. So you sat at, sure. the at the dining table. Yep. You, gave, you had this rule. Yep. And you were following the rule until you had this three-month period where you broke the rule. No, sorry. Um, so I was in the class for three months and then I failed out of it. You failed out of the class. Correct. I see. So your rule was, I'm going to sit here until I finish my homework. That was my parents' rule for me, yeah. Oh, your parents' rule Correct. for you. Yep. Okay. Except for going to things like soccer practice. I see. So those were the exceptions. Yep. But yeah, so for and three despite months. despite that rule. Yeah. And doing your best. Correct. You failed. Yes. And that was, that was a, light, <laughs> a light bulb moment for you. Um, or, or maybe a paradigm shift. Yeah, I think you, it was the start of one. Okay. Because um, then I think I noticed the same pattern in um, uh, being interested in young girls when I was like the same age as me when I was in seventh grade uh -huh. uh, or eighth grade and realized that even when I was dating the girl that I wanted to date, there was part of me that wanted like a, to date a better girl. <laughs> and so, right, it's kind of like the there's always better and yeah. eventually there's a girl who will say no. Eventually there's a class that I can't pass. I see. So that was the pattern, um, okay. which the way I generally articulate it is I experienced the book of Ecclesiastes mm. before I'd ever really read it. Mm -hmm. um, similar pattern that um, was kind of the final straw uh, was, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but I talked to my parents about wanting to start going to parties in high school. Told them I'm not going to do anything illegal, I'm not going to do anything too stupid, but go, uh, which they were fine with. Uh, and I didn't, didn't, uh, unless going to the party itself is sinful, didn't do anything sinful. Didn't yeah. drink anything, yeah. didn't touch anyone, didn't do any, yeah. anything like that. I just wanted to go to observe. Yeah. Um, because I was starting to realize that I didn't know what was, what there was to be living for. Because education uh, was what I was told. Right. But that has a ceiling. Yep. That That's going to... Um, Right, that's chasing after the wind, if you will. Uh, relationships also seem to be chasing after the wind. So then um, parties were, well, everyone else seems to like them. But then I would go there and have multiple, I would actually spend most of the time just talking with people, how they would tell me how they, the only reason they were drinking and doing whatever else they were doing is because they hated their lives so much and they respected the fact that I was there not drinking. This is in high school? Yes. This is in high school? Yeah. So... Wow. I was sitting there. Amazing thinking, they could articulate that. Yeah. While drunk. <laughs> yeah, I guess I never counted how many drinks I had, but yeah. <laughs> uh, while under the while influence. Drinking. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I think they probably felt guilty. One of them I know was another uh, church kid in particular. But, um, huh, interesting. But, so I had went there thinking they might know what's worth living for uh -huh. and came away with the idea that they think I know what's worth living for, and I clearly don't, so... It's kind of, yeah, life chasing the wind again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the end of high school, and I can't articulate the means, if you will, but remember to having the thought that if there is nothing besides the physical world, there can be no meaning, can be no purpose. Mm -hmm. If there is something outside of that, then that thing defines purpose. Mm -hmm. So started like trying to dive into apologetics, like why, listening to debates. Why apologetics? Well, like listening to debates. Is what I mean. Just uh, not necessarily religious debates, but any kind no. of debates. No, religious debates. But if what, there's a God, no. But, so, but why that versus, um, or I guess I would say why Christianity? It wasn't. It wasn't just Christianity. Oh, okay. It was just if there's a God in general. Okay. So just general seeking for something mm -hmm. beyond the physical. Yeah, because I think, and again, don't know why. I think looking back theologically, the Lord was just working on me. Um, but yeah, the idea that if there is nothing outside of the natural world, then meaning and purpose is a facade. Mm -hmm. If there is, then that defines meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what meaning and purpose is, you got to answer that question. Yeah. So I tried to, but I just used the internet, which wasn't great. 
But was, yeah, the best tool I knew. That's the tool you had. Yeah. Were you reading the scriptures at all? Mm, I think by that time I'd read through the Bible once, but uh-huh. mostly just to say I did it. Don't remember anything from it. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. Okay. So there wasn't like a intentional reading or study of nope. the Bible. Nope. Uh, read a lot, but mostly Roald Dahl, Harry Potter, those kinds of things. Uh huh. Uh huh. Like lots of people don't know, there's actually a second book to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. There is. Yep. Yeah, my kids have read it. Nice. Yeah. Not very common. No, it's not. And um, well, I bought the Roald Dahl collection for them when they were when we lived in England. Nice. And um, that's when I found out about it. Okay. So, is there a sequel to James and the Giant Peach? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I thought for a minute I thought there was. What? What was um, it about? What's that? What was it about? You got a watermelon? Or something else. I don't know. That okay. would be a good premise, though. <laughs> a larger home and a yeah. peach. Yeah. <laughs> More robust uh, shell. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Not actually, yeah. Actually, if you had to live in a giant fruit, that wouldn't be a bad one. A watermelon? Yeah. Just because of the shell. Yeah, I guess that would be okay. I'd rather be in something uh, less appealing to human taste. Gotcha. I don't like any fruit, so they're all on equal footing. Okay, let's talk about diet. So you, <laughs> sure. You told me you have six espressos every morning. Yeah, not all in one cup. Of course, and then because um, that would be kind of gross. That would just be like an americano, or three americanos maybe. What about? And then you have three later in the day. Uh, up to two to four. Two to four around. Lunch, but you yeah. stay under four hundred milligrams of caffeine a day. Uh, 400 is the limit. Yeah, That's the limit. That I go for, which I think is 10, 10 espressos. Because a, an espresso has 40 milligrams of caffeine. Mm-hmm. Why is that your limit? Um, did a little quick Google, which doesn't make it correct. But I believe there was a study put out by the Mayo Clinic that under 400 milligrams of caffeine, you're fine for long-term consequences. So it's kind of the most you can have before you risk it being detrimental long-term. So I'd prefer... Let's do a fact check, Abby. Let's do a fact check. <laughs> Up to 400 milligrams of caffeine a day appears to be safe for most healthy adults. By the Mayo Clinic? But it is appears. Yeah. So maybe not confirmed. Sure. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I think all that stuff, there's got to be some some element of... Um, it'd be different for different people. Like mm-hmm. if you're less active, that would have, have to play a role. Yeah. If you have... Um, heart problems that probably plays a role Mm -hmm. but yeah so i just did a quick google and figured that's probably a good baseline but my goal is to get under that at some point but i don't know when that oh really yeah right because why not have that number and then you're in an even better position yeah i would like to do that oh yeah i'll wait till after january when the six one six kids born and my last papers are due (laughs) (laughs) then i'll consider it yeah this is so interesting. Have you done calculations on the um, the most ideal family size? No. So the number of children isn't subject to the same kind of logical <laughs> processes as no. So, caffeine? No. Um, I'm assuming you know who Vodi Bakum is? Yes. So he has talked in the past at least about kids being a blessing, uh, comparing it to getting a raise at, job, at a job, and then he says, who would say no to a raise? My understanding would be it's more like a promotion. Mm. There's additional benefits and responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's appropriate to say no to a promotion. Yeah, I can't think of any reason why you would say no to just a straight raise. I see. But yeah, because yeah, you have to consider, um, you have to consider the the responsibility side of it. Yep. Yeah. So our desire would be to have as many kids as we can take care of, but mm-hmm. take care of includes like financial like emotional, spiritual. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so I think we're on board for finding our limit to that, which we had uh, our two nieces and two nephews with us for three and a half weeks, Uh a month or two ago. And I think by the end of that, we were both thinking we could do that. Oh, (laughs) I was expecting the opposite answer. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, so you think, well, if you uh-huh. had a baby on the way, so that would make it seven total? No, I'm sorry. That is the sixth. 
a friend of mine, uh, uh, okay. when he was expecting his first, I asked him if he's excited to be a dad soon. Yeah. And then his response to that, which I cannot argue with and can't get away from, he said that that's a really good pro-choice argument. And now I can't not count in the womb as a, tell my kid. I see. Sorry. Sorry, what I, meant, what I meant was yeah. having, you had seven l- children in your home that were not, yeah. none of which were in the womb. Uh, no, uh, nine, and then one in the womb. We had two nieces, two nephews in addition oh, to- Oh, I'm sorry, I miscounted. That's all right. I, I, I thought it was one of each. Okay. I probably didn't say it clear. So you had nine total children- Running around. Ambulatory. Yes. In the home. Yeah, one kicking on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which by the way my favorite thing whenever my wife says like uh her name's alethea thea uh-huh. for short mm-hmm. anytime she goes oh she just kicked me i i really like to ask her if she wants me to kick her back <laughs> which she never said yes but do you play music for the baby no okay i don't do anything musical okay but you did do video games, and that's, I had asked you that a long time ago. <laughs> oh, yes. Let's go back. Sorry. So <laughs> you don't have to when, apologize. Yeah, um, the connection so, with the ELCA. Yeah, yeah. So somehow you've connected, you, in yeah. your mind at least, connect church, your, your early church experience with getting, yeah. getting into video games, or what's the connection there? Yeah, so when I started realizing that pattern, that everything was going to uh, run dry, mm-hmm. everything was vain. To- and you started that search for meaning outside of the physical realm mm, well that was later oh that was the okay. culmination of that process but during that process when i didn't understand um what was worth living for yeah uh i would say struggling with some depression at that point yep. which i think is a pretty reasonable response to thinking that everything you're doing is pointless and meaningless mm-hmm. which by the way is in that other norm joke about um that i mentioned the I inappropriate know. one Oh, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll not talk about it. <laughs> sure. But he just talks about, yeah, about the, I think he calls it a cold masquerade of a thing we call life. That's what he refers to. Anyway. Wow. That would be the secular outlook on life and death. Uh, no, I mean, you and I talking about oh, it. Yeah. He didn't say that, but we, is that? No, that's what Norm says in the joke, but it's about people that harm themselves, which is, I don't know. If that's appropriate to say about talk about to talk about sorry people arming themselves harming oh harming yeah oh, but interesting. i can save that for later yeah yeah but anyway the point was uh yeah i think it's a reasonable response to thinking there's that you're doing a bunch of stuff that has no meaning or no purpose to it to get depressed so i'd play video games so i didn't have to think about it interesting but and then got did, really good at them but did video games well i could see that you being very logical and pattern oriented. I could mm-hmm. see that video games would be something you would probably excel at. So what, um, but wouldn't you say there were maybe two sides to it? So on the sure. one hand, it was an escape. Mm-hmm. But then on the other hand, video games in a way gave you a sense of meaning and accomplishment. And there was the pursuit of a goal. Um, were you finding in that the, were you finding in video games the um, the manifestation of that principle which had failed in real life, which was that if you try your best, mm-hmm. you know, good things will happen? Uh, not consciously. Okay. At least. Because no, you, you were in middle school. Yeah. High, high school. school. Yeah. Yeah. It was just always like, a, I just want to play video games because then I don't feel bad. Mm. So I'll just play them forever. Okay. Well, until my parents told me to stop. How much? How often would you play? Like, what was your video game training regime? <laughs> yeah, it was very regimented. Um, was it really? No, I'm just kidding. No, I mean I played soccer. Went to school. Okay. Uh, dated a few girls. So if I wasn't in school playing soccer or spending time with those girls, I was just playing video games. How, but but you you did really well. Like, Correct. Yeah. So, talk about that. I played them. I mean, you weren't just people. a kid that played. Like I played video games, yeah. but I didn't. I didn't win anything. Sure. I, I, just, I don't know. I'm I just, just had fun with it. Yeah, I'm just good at them. Like sure, uh, but at some point, so you had to like leave your living room, or maybe oh, not. No, the 
But well, go play. I had a TV in my room that helped. But at some point you had to think, oh, I'm gonna sign up for this competition, or I got invited. Okay. To be part of a team, it was okay. actually I think a lot of fun. Well, how did know. this even come about? Like, I just can't conceive, conceive. of, sure. like all I, I know ball sports. Okay. Football, basketball, volleyball. Sure. Swimming. I think esports now are bigger than basketball. In really? terms of the revenue, yeah. I mean the. Uh, Esports meaning electronic? Yep, video games. But so for me, I grew up not playing video games that much. My parents mm -hmm. were real strict about it. But I did, I did lots of like outdoor sports. Sure. So that's, my, that's the world I understand is yeah. if I perform well on the field, the coach says something, I got recruited to play football mm -hmm. at university. Did you actually? Um, I got injured and walked onto the men's volleyball team. Okay. So I'd played that. Or we won state. In okay. high school volleyball, so I walked onto the men's team at the academy, and I did that, and then the whole Navy SEAL training on the side. Sure. So, or like pre buds training, I guess. But um, so a lot of swimming, sure. running. Yeah, I played travel soccer. Calisthenics. Too. Kind of the same thing you played. Yeah, so you did that too, but that's yeah. a different. Like, I'm sure. just wondering, how does this rando kid, yeah, with a TV in his room, go from just being good at video games? to being recognized for it and then actually invited to go sure. play things. Yeah, I mean, um, the game I played had a really strong community, but it was uh, a couple years old at the time. So like by strong community, I mean like a couple thousand people playing it regularly, even though it was a few years old. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Halo was the only game that you could play and That's right. make a significant amount of money. So it wasn't significant. But was it Halo? No. It was Star Wars Battlefront 2. Okay. Um, what year are we talking 2007. Okay. Six, seven, yeah. Yeah. Maybe eight. I don't remember. Okay. But, um, yeah, so not a significant amount of money, but can accurately state that I, I'm, I have been a world champion at something. <laughs> so, which, yeah, I'm sure most people could if they thought more creatively. But how do you become a champion? Like, what do you have to yeah. accomplish or achieve? Yeah. Is it like points based? Yeah. Is it uh, finishing yeah. a game? Yeah. Um, so it was actually teams. It was, uh, we played eight on eight. Um, and uh, do you know, like, you know, shooting games at all? Yeah. Yeah. I used so to play them a lot. Okay. So this is a Star Wars shooting game. Yeah. I played it. I played the exact game you're okay. talking about. Nice. I actually just bought it, uh, a digital copy on the new Xbox, and me and my son have been playing it. Does it take you back? Yeah. Oh, it's a blast. Does he like it? Yeah. Is that the one where he you can actually it like, team. it's not just shooting, but you can actually wield like the lightsabers. Light. Yeah. That's why that game was so cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Although I never play as a hero. Uh, oh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah, I think. You're always think on the dark lame. side? No, no. Even I never play as the Jedi. I think that's, I, yeah, I don't like it. Oh. It's too easy. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even, um, so I was playing yesterday with some friends, 2v1. We were actually playing Star Wars Battlefront too. Uh with and even without the hero, there was one game I had um so I don't know how much you remember, but there's like a reinforcement count. No, I don't where the, the goal is to each team has two hundred people. And you just play until that number hits zero. Uh but even without that, I'm getting close to a hundred kills a game. <laughs> <laughs> That's like I'm killing half the other team. So the muscle memory is there? Getting there. Yeah, yeah, getting there. Oh, no. This may yeah, throw so, you off track, man. No, you, okay. Like you have this life plan yeah. to get us back to the conversation. <laughs> is, sure. uh, you know, the homeschooling, the yeah. setting up a trust with your kids or uh, whatever. Um, yeah, business form. Yeah, the studies at PRTS, all this stuff. But it looks like you're heading down the uh, video game path again. <laughs> I mean, today I could retire if I could pull that off again. There's a lot of money in that, is, yeah. isn't there? Oh, yeah. There was uh, some guy was a couple years ago. He got a $200 million contract just to stream on top of actually winning anything. Oh, I see. Just to play on, like, Twitch. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, depending on who you ask, but, yeah, I think I was born at the wrong time. You support your family real well. Yeah. What do you think, man? I don't think my wife would be up for it. Why not? I'm not. I'm also not interested anymore. No. I don't think I could. The... The way video games are now is uh, too different. Okay. So like the way they're played. Yeah. Um, like, uh, sorry, getting back to eight on eight. There's a map. We mm -hmm. would have practice uh, two or three times a week, where oh, wow. everyone would have like a assigned role to play. Okay. Okay. Um, and then 
in that game in particular, there's different classes. And um, I forget how. One team got to choose, can you be whatever character you want, or do you, is it restricted? Um, but even in the restricted ones, my job was normally to be, I was, we called it a roamer, and I could be whatever character I wanted, and I would just do whatever. If our team captain would say, hey, we need someone to go do this, yeah. I'll just go do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, so then there was a playoffs okay. involved in it. There was like a regular season score. Yeah. Uh, and then playoffs that were involved. But yeah, it was just uh, playing a lot. Like you, I mean, if you play a lot, you know who the good people are. Yeah. And eventually started getting invited into um, the private rooms that were all people that played in the league. Mm-hmm. And when I started winning in those, mm-hmm. so people are like, hey, why don't you just be on our team? Because they just wanted good people to play against. Kind of like being on the practice squad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, And this is all happening around the time that you're having this existential crisis. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think the video games were a distraction from this pursuit of God that you were on maybe unknowingly, or or were they facilitating it in some way? Hmm. I would say facilitating it. Um, That's an interesting answer. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, or how? How? Yeah. Um, so, like in physics, right? If you're driving forward and you start to hit the brake, you're accelerating backwards. That's correct. Um, so, I think the way my mind was going was in a really bad direction, mm. and video games slowed that down. That'd be my answer. Interesting. The video games accelerated you backwards, different backwards, away from different hopelessness yeah. and yeah, despair. Yeah. Is how I would articulate it. That's probably the best argument for letting my son play video games that I've ever heard. Uh, I'm not saying he's depressed. Sure. I mean, $200 million is a pretty good argument. I think saving yourself from a lifetime of hopelessness and depression <laughs> is, better. is much better. Sure. The one I the used money to use, is just on top of it all. Yeah, the one I used to use with my parents was that there were studies that showed that it helped surgeons with their dexterity, which is part of what I was potentially wanting to do in the future. Right. So that's, I don't think they ever bought that. (laughs) That's what I would say. That's a good segue though, into this, um, goal of being a doctor. Mm -hmm. When did you come up with that idea? What long as I can remember? Really? I don't. Oh, right. There was watching ER. Yep. I don't remember a time where I had a concept of work where that wasn't what I wanted to do. And why a doctor instead of say like a combat medic or something like that? Uh, probably, I mean, I just wanted to do what was in ER. Yeah. yeah. Like I, that was what I wanted was to be a yeah. ER doc. What, now that I know more, I'd probably want to do something different, but yeah, I mean, yeah, as a kid. <clears throat> well, you did go on then to Western Michigan. Yep. And um, the way that at least what you sent me beforehand, mm-hmm. it sounds like it was in college that you yep. had this, uh, real experience of encountering the gospel. Would that be a good way of putting it? You described it as um, going down the kind of towards God path intellectually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I became intellectually convinced that Christianity was true, but uh, But, didn't know what that meant. Right, but then there was, and you you yourself put it in quotation marks, was actual hearing. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Yeah, can I back up a little bit and connect it to the Absolutely, uh, yeah. desire to be a doctor? Yeah, I know that we yeah. jumped over that. But yeah, no so those are... Because it's are, related, I think. Because yeah. it was um, uh, in one of the bio classes that actually convinced me more so um, that there must be some God. This is freshman or sophomore year? Uh, freshman. Because... Mm-hmm. Um, um, From what I remember, which I generally was a pretty good student, um, but the purpose of a species is to become, uh, to evolve, to become more fit for its environment through the process of natural selection. So like we're given a purpose statement in biology. Um, However, I had a really hard time with the concept that all of us were studying to work against that purpose. We're spending massive amounts of resources that are limited to actively go against the stated purpose of our species. Mm. That didn't make sense to me. Mm. And Did you articulate that in class? Uh, to students, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
but not to my professor. Mm-hmm. Uh, the professors were not really available at Western. Oh. At least the ones I had. Okay. A lot of them, not a lot of them, a couple of them just read straight from the book. And you, I didn't understand what. There, it seemed like they were there to do research and you were there to. You were there just to listen their way. and put the right answers down. Yeah. Which we'll get to this later, but probably is why you teach more of a dialogical method. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. I also don't like uh, monologuing normally. Yeah. I think I like people's feedback. And then when you're talking in front of a big group of people, it's harder to get feedback. Yeah. I guess, side note. Sure. Preaching might be one exception where I'm like, okay, but if the, if the guy's done the work, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of guys that don't, but that's mm-hmm. a whole other discussion. Sure. But um, at least in terms of an educational format, I experienced dialogical when I went to England, mm-hmm. and I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, at first it was like, what are we doing? You know, yeah. isn't that guy supposed to be just talking the whole time? You know, the prof. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I see what's happening. And then I started to teach at the university in that same format. Mm. Uh, but yeah, we can get to that later. Yeah, no, I like it. That'd be. So it was in the is it was in these cl- this class in pro- this one class in mm-hmm. particular. You're saying. Yeah. So in my mind, that left me with there's two options. Uh-huh. Hospitals are actually wicked and evil. Or this stuff's wrong. There's no other option, logically. I think. I still think that's true today. Let me move this mic a bit sure. closer. Sorry. No, no. Yeah, I still. I already think told you don't apologize. Um, um, so I will continue to apologize. <laughs> It's like the smiling thing. We just say sorry because we've been conditioned yeah. to do that, like the dog barking at the latch. Sure. So um, expand on that a bit. Why wouldn't yeah. why wouldn't hospitals and ERs make any sense? Because it goes against the purpose, the purpose of our species, which is to species. evolve through natural selection, and we're spending vast amounts of resources to keep those that nature is telling us ought to die alive, mm-hmm. allowing them to, uh, some might say, pollute our genome. Mm. I would never say that. Yeah, but that's the implied message. Uh, I think that's <laughs> for those the, who are willing to think about it. Yeah, I think that's the logical conclusion. I mm-hmm. don't know how you could avoid it other than saying we know that's not true, which we do. But yeah, but it doesn't. That doesn't follow logically. Yeah, right. So you saw this logical disconnect. Yep. And then what? What happened after that? Well, yeah, so I was contiguous also, with yep. that. Were you doing this? Um, this looking into. The, uh, the divine. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I believe by that point it stumbled on William Lane Craig and his debates. And I, I think, uh, I think it's called the ontological proof, the idea that um, everything that began to exist was caused to exist, and the mm-hmm. universe began to exist. And you can see that through like the radiation seeds or whatever in space. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think those two things kind of. I don't know, it was hard to say that, um, yeah, I don't know. But there must be something that's right. beyond nature. Right. And then I think if you do like historical analysis at all, which not saying I'm a historian, but if you just look at uh, the historicity of Christianity and uh, Islam, for example, you have like a dozen people at the time talking about Jesus and I'm not an evidentialist, by the way, to be clear. I actually okay. very much against evidential apologetics. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, that's what I was trained in, kind of. Um, but you have like 12 people at the time talking about this guy, Jesus, uh, dying. Uh, some of them saying he rose, some of them saying he didn't. Then you get one dude 600 years later in a cave saying he didn't. Like, I'm not trying to be mean, but that's pretty, uh, this isn't mean. That's pretty one sided. I was going to say, Different word that my kids aren't supposed to say. But yeah, no, I mean, historically, that's like a silly argument. Yeah. That one guy 600 years later is saying yeah. all the people there at the time were wrong. Yeah. 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 I think that's silly. Yeah. Yeah. I'd never thought about it that way. So this is going on in your head. Yeah. And what conclusions are you coming to intellectually before the, in quotation marks, hearing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought Christianity was true. Okay. Is it? I just so and then it true. And you're like, okay, yeah, I guess I won't go. Did that like resolve any of these questions in your mind, or, or no. it's just kind of like, okay, good, moving on? Yeah, more that. Didn't, um, 
I think it was helpful in terms of like trying to figure out if I was gonna, um, like what crowd I was gonna hang out with. That was mm. about it. That was the only difference it made. But when you when you say the word Christianity mm-hmm. at that time, what how comprehensive was that? Because Christianity for some people just means what we consider the gospel, mm-hmm. or I guess the limited sure. view of the gospel, which is Jesus died for your sins. Didn't know wrote, that. What's that? I didn't know that. You didn't know that? Mm-mm. Okay. So then when you say Christianity, mm-hmm. I, I guess what I mean by comprehensive yeah. is that like God is creator. He is triune. Yep. He came as a man. He died and rose again and triumphed over sin and death. He sent his spirit. You know, all the stuff, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Where had you? Yeah. You weren't there at all the nope. stuff, right? Nope. Okay. Didn't know any of that. Um, um, sorry, I was trying to think, uh, I was trying to think of a way of saying it without throwing C.S. Lewis under the bus, but I can't, so I won't, but, (laughs) um, but no, I mean, there's people that take an apologetic methodology where you want to make the bar to believe as low as possible. Right. Uh, I believed in a low bar that I don't think saved me, that there is actually a God, that Jesus actually existed, uh, and that the Bible is probably accurate. Mm. Mm. So that was, that was your was it. base kind of stepping up onto that, yep. the stairway as it were. Yeah. Hmm. Yep, but okay. that didn't, the only thing that meant was I was going to not hang out with my friends who were continuing to go to parties, and I was going to uh, join a Christian group out on campus. That was it. Well, hold on a minute. How how did how was there any kind of a uh, moral component to that, or ethical component for you? Why couldn't you just because you believe that those mm-hmm. fundamental things were mm-hmm. true or probably accurate, as you said about mm-hmm. the Bible? Why would that change your behavior? Um, yeah, I think growing up in the ELCA, I knew there was moral aspects of it, things you're supposed to do, things you're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what they were, but that's why I wanted to join the Christian group. Yeah. Was there also a part of you that wanted to know more and you thought, hey, those people might have know more Mm -hmm. about this than I do? Uh, Again, I don't think that was a conscious thought. Yeah. Other than like knowing what I'm supposed to do, I guess. So maybe, yeah, I guess. Okay. But not like, the. I didn't have a category for theology. So I wasn't trying to. Like, I wasn't trying to learn about God. Didn't know that was something you could do. Mm-hmm. I was just trying to know what I was supposed to do and what I wasn't supposed to do. I just don't understand why you would change your tribe. Sure. It, uh, on that basis, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if for you it was, mm-hmm. it was. Well, I thought I was a Christian, so I should spend time with Christians. So again, yeah. The logic of Nick Kellogg. Sure. I mean, that's not a bad <laughs> thought, right? Not at all. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand your brain. It's a fascinating sure. brain. The way that your brain works is oh, very, very interesting. So I'm a Christian. Get, well, I'll send that to my wife. Never mind. What's that? That quote. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's like. I'm just kidding. She thinks so too, but it also bothers her a lot. Not it. I bother her a lot. Hey, join the club. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm married too. Um. I wouldn't say I bother my wife. Maybe I annoy I, her. Things yeah. I do annoy her sure. and bother her. Yeah. So yeah. let's change topic. So the um, that's very interesting. So in the, in the mind of Nick Kellogg, and that's yeah. just because I'm different, I guess. Sure. But there are, I'm sure there are many people like you who would think, okay, Christianity, I believe it's true. You, have, you don't have it all figured out yet. But you're like, so I'm going to hang out with Christians now. Instead of these party people, yeah, who don't like, I mean, who don't, who want, don't, don't yeah. call themselves Christians, yeah, don't think they don't really God. care. Yeah, I think also maybe, and I don't think I ever thought this, but maybe I also thought that people would think similarly about the world. Mm-hmm. And so most of my, like most of my friends, when I would tell, when I would ask them like about the hospitals thing, they just say like, I don't know, hospitals are fine. I'd be like, I, yeah, I agree, but I don't. <laughs> but that's not really what I'm saying. Yeah. And just would go nowhere. Yeah. So I was hoping that maybe, again, I never, I don't think I consciously thought this, but uh-huh. maybe it was subconscious in terms of 
maybe there's other people that when I ask those types of questions, they would like discuss them. Uh -huh. Just like, uh, like, you know, they're good and move on. Did you find that with the Christians you were hanging out with? Did some. Yeah. Some of them were willing to think on that level? Yeah. Yeah. And this was at Western? Yep. Campus Crusade for Christ. And that's where you found your, your tribe, your new tribe? Yep. 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 Funny way that the first guy that I remember sharing the gospel with me shared it real quick is he was asking, um, well, it was actually... Uh, providential in some ways in that like I had um, uh, I don't think this is as dumb as it's going to sound but I actually had a plan with some friends from high school we were going to rent a yacht for spring break because I think the way we worked it out for a week it would cost us each like 150 bucks or something that we could actually afford that fell through I had nothing to do for spring break Campus Crusade does this thing big break okay. I don't know if you're familiar with it no you go down to Panama City Beach for a week, um, little did I know, for evangelism. <laughs> Didn't know that. But it was 50 bucks. Were you a Christian at this time? Like, like actually? Yeah. No. Wow. Not when I signed up. That's Because it was uh, driving down to Panama. I was driving, and the staff guy uh -huh. was in the passenger seat, and he was asking me, like, what is it you want to do with your life? I'm like, oh, I want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, what, like, what are you hoping to do? And being a good Christian, I said that I wanted to also do Doctors Without Borders because you help yeah. people, you yeah. know? There you go. Uh, and his response to that was, he's like, that's really interesting. What good is it if you're going to help people live 10 to 20 years longer and then they die and go to hell for eternity? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I just asked him, like, what are you talking about? Huh. And that was, uh, yeah, I think the, um, yeah, I don't remember anything else about the conversation. But mm. then on that trip, um, the same staff guy asked like us, all of us students, uh, what sins can someone commit and still be a Christian? Or what sins disqualify you from being a Christian? Mm. And in my mind, it was like, well, probably killing people. Uh, maybe a few other things. Like yeah. if there's probably a certain amount of money if you steal, you're no longer a Christian. And that was the first time I'd ever seen some that I recall, to be clear. First time I remember seeing somebody opening the Bible to provide an answer to a question. Oh, interesting. And it was the okay. first John, the, um, uh, if anyone has a son, he has a life. And mm. I think, I don't, I mean, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, can't explain why I believed that that was true. Mm. And so believed that that was what made someone a Christian, mm -hmm. was believing the, uh, Christ, believing mm -hmm. in him. Mm -hmm. And I did. Don't really have a, yeah. Don't really have a good Arminian answer for that one. Just You don't need one. I agree. It wouldn't be a correct one anyway. <laughs> we'll probably kick you off the podcast. <laughs> sure. No, but you know what I mean? No, no, I, like, wouldn't, I, wouldn't. I don't have like a good like that's what I meant earlier. I think earlier I said like I don't I can't articulate the means of arriving at that idea that if uh the natural world's all there is, there's no purpose. Yeah. I have no idea why a high schoolers thinking about those things. Yeah. I'm pressing you on those questions because you're the, you're the kind of person who would be able to articulate that if you could. And because you can't, in a way, is um, an indication of the Spirit's work, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's how I would articulate it. Yeah. Because yeah. I have no, yeah. Uh, the only other recollection, the only other memory I have from that week trip was someone asking me, was meeting someone who knew, um, I don't even remember her name, Hermione from Harry Potter movies. Yeah. Emma, I forget if it's Watson, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then trying to figure out a way if I could go meet her. It's the only other thing I remember from that trip. <laughs> Which, yeah. That's don't, quite different than yeah. the whole... The rest of the trip? Hell <laughs> argument. Yeah. Was it... Had you heard much about hell in your upbringing? Yeah, I was going to say. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of probably quite shocking mm -hmm. You're like hey man i just told you something that was like really good <laughs> yeah like helping people yeah he's like yeah they're still gonna die and go to hell yeah no that was a new idea never heard of i don't remember hearing it sorry i tried to be clear in terms of it's totally possible that that stuff got talked about uh in the church and i just yeah, don't but there's remember. times that we just there's times that we actually hear yeah or like you say well, that's why i put hear. it in quotes yeah we hear but don't process or yep 
But I'm, I guess I'm trying to be clear that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about the people at the church in ways that are inaccurate, and that's one way of trying to protect mm-hmm. that in terms of they yeah. there very well could be many people there that actually believe the Bible and articulated the gospel, and I just never understood yeah. it or heard it. That's yeah. definitely a possibility. Yeah. Unlikely, yeah. but possible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So what happened after this? So now you come back from the trip. Yep. You're, I would, I guess we could say the spirit dwells in you now. Mm-hmm. And does anything change? Mm. You're already hanging out with the Christians. Yeah. Um, I, don't think, any, I don't think a lot at that point. Were you connected with a like local church at the time? or no. was? Okay. No. Um, my, again, my recollection, and this is a different staff guy, but that when uh, I think my junior and senior year, I had to sign a document saying I wouldn't be involved in a local church Would in not? order to be in leadership. Yeah. In order- my recollection. Because I needed to be committed to the ministry. Of Campus Crusade? Yeah. So you couldn't be... I could go on Sundays, but that was... You yeah. couldn't be involved in any capacity beyond yeah. attending. Mm-hmm. Is that which the case with Campus Crusade? No, it was just a specific guy. Oh, good. It's definitely not a Campus Crusade policy. Oh, okay. Um, but at that, that would be a bad policy. Correct. But at that time, though, my only experience of church was people who don't believe the Bible. So I thought real Christians were involved in like a... I don't know, Campus Crusade, I guess, and mm-hmm. then churches were not real Christians. Oh, wow. That's interesting. And incorrect, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you're, were you aware of the vast root structure of denominations that is Christianity these days? Nope. No. Nope. I don't, yeah, no. The only church I've ever been to is that Lutheran church and then Catholic uh I guess mass, which I wouldn't call it that, but yeah. uh, when we would visit my grandparents in Detroit. Okay. Are they still Catholic? Not anymore. <laughs> Sorry, that was meant to be a norm joke. It's a good norm joke. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, if you didn't get it and you're listening, they're both dead. <laughs> they're Protestants now. <laughs> I, think I think they had a <clears throat> legitimate uh, yeah. belief in the Lord. With yeah. a lot of bad doctrine, my grandparents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, parents still around? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is that a that is an appro- okay joke to make? You can say anything you want on this podcast. Okay. If if we get in trouble, we'll just edit edit it out. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was funny. No, um, yeah, I got also, it. Also, yeah, yeah, I have a weird sense of humor. I think sometimes I have a. Do you mind if I tell you a little story? That's why we're here. And then, can I show you a picture? Yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. Um, Nick uh, is breaking paradigms on the Puritan podcast. Sorry. You're leaning in heavy on, like, why we created this thing. Okay. It's just to talk to people and get to know them and hear stories about. I mean, because where we're going to end up is a guy who's, like, reformed, PRTS, in ministry. I'm a reformed Baptist. I don't know if that counts. I'm reforming. You'd have there to talk are. to, uh, I don't know. Some of our other guests would say yes, and others would say no. I know. Brooks I, is Baptist, right? I just think I just think it's funny to to pump the brakes when people say reformed. <laughs> I just think it's funny. That's all. Yeah. Um, you're good, man. You're in good company. I mean, I went to Master Seminary. Yeah. That's Westminster. Some people say that's not at all reformed. So, or lowercase reformed. Yeah, I mean Calvinist. But yeah. Let's let's do something quite different, Norm, Norm sure. MacDonald, which is talk about when he started reading the Puritans. Sure. So um, yep. when was this in your Christian journey? Mm-hmm. And and yeah, I still I'm really curious to know about when you found a church, where was it and mm-hmm. why? Yeah. Can it is it good to just start from the campus? Well, I'm just kind of like baiting you and you sure. can start wherever you'd like sure yeah so went on that trip spring break that's when i'm uh my best guess would be that i was regenerated um first time i remember believing no understanding the gospel and believing it 
Mm-hmm. Um, then went and did a three month thing that Campus Crusade does. They call it summer projects. Okay. They did. I don't know. Yeah. It's again quite evangelistic. Yep. Yeah. But the same staff guy who invited me to Panama City on the spring break trip said, if you liked the spring break trip, this thing is the spring break trip on steroids. So okay. I was like, All right. We'll do it. Okay. Uh, that was the first time I started reading my Bible regularly. Mm. First time I recall hearing a sermon that opened the Bible. Yeah. Which, by the way, was Mark Driscoll's How Dare You sermon. <laughs> that was the first sermon I heard, and I was like, oh, man, there's actually people that believe the Bible. dare you say his name on this podcast? No, went, you're good. Um, you're good. You're good. He, uh, that's a good Harry Potter reference. So he <laughs> must not be named. Um, but, yeah, uh, so okay, that was the first sermon. And that was the first time I remembered thinking, wow, someone actually believes the Bible and they mm. like teach it. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is when you started reading, going back to the beginning of this whole podcast, mm-hmm. is uh, the ESV? It might have been NAV at the time. Okay. Because it, uh, it was just a Bible I had had growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But got home, got back from that, and then got an ESV shortly after that. So that was the first one I actually started reading. I see. But the one I had with me, I think, might have been NIV. Yeah, yeah. To be clear. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so started reading my Bible pretty regularly. Okay. Listened to a lot of He Who Shall Not Be Named. Uh, over 300 sermons, because my the job I had at the time, I could listen to audio. Okay. Um, yeah, so I listened to, like, 300-plus sermons <laughs> of that guy, which is kind of ironic in that um, my wife went to Mars Hill for eight years. Yeah, my brother was up there for a long time. Okay, and when her and I met, I knew more about not the inner workings of the church, but I knew more about the sermons than yeah. she did, which yeah. was kind of funny. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, but, yeah, then started reading uh, people that I would hear in sermons. Um, mm-hmm. I stumbled on something called The Elephant Room that I think James McDonald put That's out. That's right. Found That's other right. pastors, started listening to them. Mm-hmm. Um. And, you know, mixed bag for sure. Well, I'm actually not sure it's mixed, but. I think a lot of us are like that. Sure. I mean, I'm sure there are people who aren't, but yeah. my journey is quite similar. Okay. Um, yeah, so they. Like you wanted to hear someone open the Bible and talk about it mm-hmm. and explain it. Mm-hmm. And perhaps in younger years when I had less discernment, it was sure. just, oh, here's a man opening the Bible and telling me what it means. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think, yeah, I think, um, excuse me, um, yeah, I do remember what it is. I don't know how much it matters, but there was something that uh, he who shall not be named said that um, I'm hoping that will bother you at some point. <laughs> so or like funny, no, I like it. It's funny. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, that I remember, like, uh, I'm going to stop listening to him. It had something to mm. do with, like, uh, like prophetic gifts that, um, mm-hmm. but in my mind, I thought he was, uh, speaking in a way that seemed contrived. So stop listening to him, started listening to Matt Chandler. Um, I can explain. I don't have to, I don't care. It's not. So that's interesting. No, we can, we can okay. like <laughs> work around that a bit. So, um, which at the time I would have been a continuationist theologically. Uh huh. So, so even though that's, that was actually where I was going. Yeah. So you would have considered yourself a continuationist. Yeah. And yet, but believe, but who reads his Bible and sure, sure. knows it enough that, like, when my friends in college would say, "God wants me to sleep with my boyfriend because then he'll become a Christian," I would say, "No, he doesn't," because here's what he has actually said. Right. So that kind of continuationist, which I don't think lasts very long. But then here's Driscoll, and I'll, I don't mind saying his name. Here's Driscoll talking about. Is the door locked? (laughs) (laughs) Is Driscoll talking about prophetic gifts, and that was a that was a turn off? No, the way he talked about it, there was a particular sermon where he talked about wanting to plant churches and referenced Phoenix, Mm -hmm. and he like said it as kind of a joke, like, "Oh, that might be the Holy Spirit talking." Oh, interesting. Then I think like a month or two later, they announced a church plant in Phoenix, and I was like, "There's no way he didn't know they're planting a church in Phoenix." Oh wow! Okay, that bothered me, so I just stopped listening to him. Yeah. But that was, um, I mean, years before Marcel fall apart. Yeah, fall apart. So, so then you start listening Which to I Matt. I do. I do want to mention the yeah. Marcel thing at some point. Yeah, yeah. With my wife, but but so you start listening to Matt Chandler. Chandler. Yep. Uh huh. 
okay. at that point. Yeah. And started I mean, to read. They were still part of the X29 yep. network, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, well, let me find something in the same kind of ballpark. Yeah, but started reading like uh, the first Christian book I remember reading was Sun Stand Still by David, uh, Stephen Furtick. Went from there to reading some David Platt to John Piper. Yeah. To um, A.W. Tozer, J.I. Packer. Yeah. And that, I don't know, I guess once you start reading Packer, it's not a huge leap to the Puritans. No. So this is good. And by the way, it's fine if you say these people's names because um, yeah. we, I think a lot of guys, especially guys, but I'd say also females, mm -hmm. get on this journey where we, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. Like we're young and we were hungry. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I remember for me, like I'd gotten married and wasn't really, like I was part of a um, Calvary Chapel at the yep. time. And um, even though I was raised at Grace Community Church at MacArthur's Church well, as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. so I, but again, I wasn't saved then. <clears throat> and so when on this kind of like march back to reform, reform perspective, mm -hmm. it wasn't like an overnight thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a mi real mixed bag of things that I was reading. And I just, I mean, I, I love hearing stories like this because I know that they're going to be encouraging for people listening who are either still on that same journey or came through the same thing. It's like, there's just a gratefulness there. Mm -hmm. And, but also an acknowledgement that like we shouldn't be embarrassed. I don't think you said we should or should not should not be right. embarrassed. But the fact that like I have sat in house churches where people were telling me that I, you know, um, the Lord is warning me about getting over my cocaine addiction. And I'm like, I've never had a cocaine addiction. You know, I've never even tried this stuff, mm -hmm. but you just sit yeah. there quietly and listen to them because well, they're similar. I think we, we should distinguish and, of an issue with the idea of regret similarly because yeah. we're denying in some ways the providence that God exactly. used to make, bring us where we are. Exactly. And I, I think I'm comfortable saying I would have liked to arrive where I am without <laughs> those things, but yeah, I'm not going to, uh, yeah, I think it's a bad idea to kind of poo poo on God's means of working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would make for a pretty Even boring story. Crooked sticks, right? Yeah. It would make for quite a boring story though. If you had come in here and said, yeah, I started reading, reading Owen when I was six and my dad was a reformed pastor and I've just, I was meant gotcha. for ministry and I love reading the Puritans. I'd be like, okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, that would be a, a beautiful story. I'm not denying That's, that. Yeah. I'm hoping but, for my kids. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we yeah. try and cor correct the things that yeah. in our childhood were not the ideal, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like my wife yeah. and I, <clears throat> we're talking about this, uh, this the other day is, um, so our five, we have three kids and our, we have 14, 11 and five and our five-year-old every single night at dinner says, dad, can we do family worship? And then my 14 year old, who's the boy is like, Oh, why'd you have to ask him? You know, he doesn't want to do it. She wants to do it. Mm -hmm. The middle daughter also wants to do it. But we were talking about as a family and I was telling the kids, I'm like, you know, my, I was talking to my wife, but the kids are listening. And I'm saying, you know, I don't remember my dad doing family worship. Mm -hmm. He was just of a different generation, the kind of, you didn't talk about your faith as much. Like mm -hmm. his dad never talked about his faith. My dad did more, but there was, n there was no consistent, like, sure. we're going to sit as a family. We're going to read the scriptures together. Dad's going to explain it. Do you know if he talked politics by chance? My dad? Or your grandpa, yeah. Did he talk politics? Because my dad... Um, That's a good question. My grandpa on my dad's side, the Catholics were on my mom's side. Uh -huh. Would They would talk politics all the time in the house, but they would not talk religion at all. And mm. that's also how my dad is. Mm. He started talking more and reading his Bible some, which is okay. pretty encouraging. But, yeah, yeah. But yeah, he, he grew up in a house of uh, Lutherans who would talk politics all day long. Uh, but it was impolite to talk about religion. Okay. Which I think is funny. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I know that my, this is just my family. I'm sure there's people listening who are like this, but my grandma on my dad's side was a like old Scottish Presbyterian, you know, 
which, um, yeah, well, never mind. I won't say that. Um, but the, the women in the family have tended to be the ones who are much more vocal and prayerful, mm -hmm. like publicly, like publicly religious, mm -hmm. like in a good way, like yeah. they are saved. They're, they're believers, mm -hmm. but the men have tended to be much more reserved and keep it to yourself kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Again, for my dad, I'm, this isn't a criticism of him, and he has set such an incredible example for all of us of what it means to be a believer in terms of generosity and yeah. just complete dying, loyal commitment to us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but there was, it was always the women that were much more the publicly religious. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I look at my story. I hope my kids are even more so. You know, I hope yeah. they do a better job than I do of trying to do family worship yeah, and same. catechism because I'm doing the best I can, I think. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm doing the best. But you are trying. I'm trying, yeah. but I could do better. Sure. Um, but anyway, all that to say that all these names that you're mentioning, mm -hmm. that's that's a lot of us, our journey. Yeah. You know, and I and you're right. It all comes back to the providence of God, and um, who, oh, I had been telling a story. So my wife and I are married. We're in Brazil. I'd been, we'd been going to Calvary Chapel. It's been fine, you know. But also these little house churches that were a bit cuckoo. Sure. And um, we, the Lord, I would say, made us get really sick for like a week. We were just holed up <coughs> in this uh, apartment in Sao Paulo. And um, I was perusing YouTube and up pops the Larry, is it Larry King Live with John with MacArthur? MacArthur? Yeah. Well, the, I, mean, I think he's got a couple, but that's one of them. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. The algorithm made these things show up. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you click on one and it shows you more. Mm -hmm. And I started listening to these and I turned to my wife. I'm like, that's my old pastor. <laughs> Like and it brought these waves of nostalgia, mm -hmm. and it was a it was a really important turning point for us. Where suddenly we're like, wait a minute, we're not really hearing. I wouldn't have expressed it at that time, but sure. like expository preaching, mm -hmm. where the Bible is being explained in a very deep and exegetical way. Yeah, everything had been quite topical and the kind of thing where you a pastor would go up and be like you know, I spent all week on these, on my sermon and I was really wanting to come here today to talk to you guys about this. But this morning I woke up and the spirit just gave yeah. me this message. And then it's like, rah, you know, and you hear yeah. this off the cuff kind of talk. Yeah. So it's presented as off the cuff. I'm not sure they always are, but yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe not. I always took them at their word. <laughs> it's probably the more Christian thing to do. But, <laughs> but um, anyway, that was a big turning point for me. And, mm -hmm. and sure, I'd been reading all this kind of stuff. In fact, someone had given me, um, uh, what's his name? The, the Mars Hill here. Rob Bell. Rob Bell's book on love mm -hmm. or his definition of love. Yeah. And uh, someone at the time had thought this was a great thing to read and I should read it, you know? So we've all been on that journey. Mm -hmm. Not, I wouldn't say we've all, but a lot of us have been on that journey. And in a way, I think, um, especially for me, it makes finding reformed literature, and I'd say especially the Puritans, mm -hmm. that much sweeter. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, to put it in an analogy, like I, I grew up swimming um, and going to the beach as a kid, but I didn't start surfing till I was in college. Gotcha. Whereas my cousin's kids, they still live in LA. Mm -hmm. They started surfing when they were three and they're really good at it mm -hmm. way better than I am. But I think I have more enjoyment surfing sure. yeah, because it's this thing of like, Oh, this is this new amazing thing. That's even better than just swimming. Mm -hmm. So it's like, with reading the Puritans and this this reform literature, finding it later on, because I have something to contrast it with, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is Rob Bell's book. <laughs> yeah, it's a little different. So, okay, sorry, enough Here about go. me. So uh, you, real quick, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I like to reference the third dark dark night, 
when talking about it. Okay. Uh, you know, Bane and Batman. You're familiar with that movie. I have not seen that one. That's Sorry. Okay. Yeah. You can still tell. A lot of our listeners though. have, I'm sure. Do you see the one with the Joker? Keith, Heath Ledger? Like the Joker? No, no, no. The Dark Knight with the Joker. Batman with the Joker. No, I have not. Okay. No worries. Um, but there's one with Bane by Tom, uh, Tom Hardy's playing Bane. Mm-hmm. Where Bane talking to Batman says, uh, he's talking, he, I think Batman shuts the lights off. Maybe I haven't seen it in a long time. Okay. You can fact check me. Uh, haven't seen it in a long time, but I think Batman shuts the lights off. And then Bane's talking, saying that you think your advantage lies in the darkness. Well, I was born in the darkness. You've merely adopted it. Uh, I like to say that to my more reformed friends. It's like, you grew up in the covenant. I'm just adopting it. <laughs> but, yeah. but how, Batman, do they re- how do they respond to that? Uh, like you I weren't, think they think you it's weren't funny. like you weren't yeah. raised. You weren't raised um, with like the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Neither, neither was I. Mm-hmm. But I think it's also funny with uh, pedo baptism. Okay, I think it's a multi-layered joke. Okay, because in pedo baptism, right, you're born into the covenant. Yes. Yeah, I think yes. that's funny. <laughs> but I do like to remind him that Batman wins. But yes, Bev. <laughs> You're going to get some hate mail after this. That's okay. From certain brothers. I don't check my mail, so. Oh, that's right. We'll get to that. Okay, Puritans. When did you start yep. reading them and why? Yeah. Um, just from the guys I was listening to and the other books I was reading, same thing where I realized the uh, similar, rather, to the gentle and lowly that I mentioned, that yeah. they were referencing these older books. Okay. And I was like, wait, if they're just, re-articulating things these guys said i'll just start to read those guys mm-hmm. but that was uh, i think so like piper for example yeah yeah i mean piper right huge edwards fan but yeah so why not read edwards I right yeah. no no i'm saying oh, yes i went through the same yes. thing yeah i was reading a lot of piper yeah. but I do, I do think though for what it's worth um that was the year after i got back from the netherlands working with crew for a year and what is crew campus crusade for christ they switched their name to be more welcoming to Muslims. Oh, okay. I believe. Oh. I, I, I think that wasn't a joke. I think that was legitimately what they said. What's the new name now? Crew. It used to be Campus Crusade for Christ. No, but I mean, what does it stand for? Campus Crusade for... It stands for Campus Crusade for Christ, but they just shortened it because the word crusade, I think, had a negative connotation with uh, Muslims. Oh. Like genuinely, oh, I believe that's wow. what they said. But crew is just short for crusade. Only if you know, yeah. All right. But anyway, it was actually when I was in the Netherlands um, that uh, became like more reformed in my theology. I think prior to that, I would have been an Arminian, uh, okay. knowing the terms and yeah. believing that uh, in the idea of like free will, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. which I actually now don't think anyone actually believes in free will. I think they think they do, but... Uh, I think it's a really, really bad term. Um, mm-hmm. But um, oh have yeah, have you read this guy on the will? Bondage of the will. Yeah. No, but I've listened to Carl Truman talk about it. Just basically, just Come as on, good. man, you always go to the source. That's a challenge to you. I'm going to leave you with this challenge. <laughs> to read it. Yeah. Uh, when you have time. Okay, that one I can commit to. Okay. But as long as we give that qualifier. Yeah. It's already on my list. Okay, it's good. just a little bit down there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had already become kind of reformed. Um, Would you have uh, identified yourself that way? Did you reformed? know you were becoming more reformed, or was no, it just Calvinist you were stuff. just reading more? I would have said Calvinist at that point. Okay. Um, and and yet not like confessionally reformed. Correct. You hadn't. Wouldn't have latched on to Westminster or 1689 or didn't know that category at all. Um, just knew that I was just convinced the way the Bible spoke Mm -hmm. about it Mm -hmm. uh, was that, um, we're dead, God brings us back, like He brings us to life. Yeah, had you read any Calvin yourself? Nope. Is it okay to call ourselves Calvinists if we haven't read Calvin? Um, it's a legitimate question. I think it, uh, well, that's kind of like the straw. How many holes does the straw have? Question. Uh, I don't know. I think it depends on what you mean by those words. Yeah. I don't yeah. care too much. Yeah. I'm even 
by the way, as a Reformed Baptist, fine with people calling my unbaptized kids Christians. I don't really care. I think it depends on what they mean. But, um, but anyway, sorry, I was saying, meaning that uh, had became somewhat Calvinistic in my soteriology. Can't say it that way. If I hadn't read Calvin at that point. Oh, you can say it however you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and realized actually that um, the evidential apologetics that I had learned, mm-hmm. and um, there's a well-known professor at Westminster, or sorry, at Western, mm-hmm. who's pretty into evidential apologetics. Okay. Um, that I like did an independent study with that was based on evidential apologetics and something that he called unintended consequences mm-hmm. or unintended might have been coincidences. But the idea that in one gospel you, you see Jesus asking Philip, hey, where can we go to get bread? And it, it's kind of a throwaway line. But then in another gospel, it talks about how Philip was from that area. And so that like it it's meant to build a case that the they they have to be accurate for that level of detail to fit together. That was kind of a big thing he was into. I see. Um but realized that when my full-time job was evangelism, that um, that the approach to evangelism and apologetics I was taking did not fit my theology, and so Googled Calvinist evangelism and stumbled on a guy named Jeff Durbin mm-hmm. and started reading or listening to Jeff Durbin, listening to some Greg Bonson, started reading Van Til, uh, and then heard out heard about Westminster from there. But anyway, the um the thing that convinced me that I needed to stop doing evangelism the way it was was with evidential apologetics. Um my thinking was if you can convince someone there's an 80% chance there's a god, you're doing really well. If you can convince them there's an 80% chance Jesus is god, that's also really good. 80% chance the Bible is true, that's also good. But when you like think about probability that's less than 50% chance, mm-hmm. but then you're asking them to change everything about their lives, and I was like, that's, that doesn't make any sense to me. Also, more based on Romans uh, 1, started thinking that what I'm, the method I'm actually using acts as though my arguments are the power of God for salvation, not the gospel, mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. I had no idea what to do with that, so that's when I Googled Calvinist. Evangelism. What did you find when you Googled that, and did and how did it change the way that you did evangelism? Yeah, Jeff Durbin talking about presuppositional apologetics, mm-hmm. um, which the I believe I don't remember the way he articulates it, but basically theology that informs your apologetics, which is what I was looking for. Mm. Did you stay with Campus Crusade? No, much I, longer no, after that. No, because I also became convinced that uh, doctrine matters, and they're um, they were much too ecumenical for me. And I was spending most of my yeah. time arguing with my coworkers because mm. I thought their theology was detrimental to what they're trying to do. Okay. Um, and then also became convinced at that time that um, although I do think it is okay to talk about the church being God's people broadly, I think that if that you all, we also need to realize and remember that God has organized his people into local churches. Mm. And so had uh, um, did not think I could continue working with the parachurch ministry at that point. So I just came back to Kalamazoo and started doing a general contracting with a guy that I knew and reading Puritans. Okay, so you had been working, like as you said, your full-time gig was crew. Mm-hmm. And, yep. Yeah. In the, but it was a year-long commitment in the Netherlands. Yeah. I see. And so you come back from the Netherlands. Yep. Were you going to church out there? Yep. Okay. Well, but was it kind of like the crew? Yeah, it group? was like a they church. All, we all went yeah. together, kind yep. of thing. Okay. Yep. Didn't really have any say in the church. So you come fun. back. Okay. So you come back to Kalamazoo. Mm-hmm. You're. Start you, reading John Owen. Start reading. Okay. So you start. Well, how did that come about? Just from. Uh, listening to and reading John Piper. Uh, okay. Well, no, sorry. Jeff Durbin, R.C. Sproul, started mm-hmm. listening to those guys. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then um, I think also started to take, uh, 
um, seriously the call to put to death our own sin. And then I think if you're trying to figure out how to do that, uh, you're prob- most roads are going to lead you to John Owen hmm. at that point. Okay. And I'd still say indwelling sin and believers, even though I don't think Romans 7 is actually talking about a believer. I yeah. still think it's probably my favorite book of all time. Romans? Uh, no, sorry, indwelling sin and believers. Oh, okay. Yeah, even though I think, I don't think he's correct exegetically. I still, yeah, it's still my favorite book. It's still, I think, the most helpful book for counseling out there. Okay. Well, we'll get to counseling. Sure. Um, you're you're back in the states now. Yep. In Kalamazoo. Yep. Why Kalamazoo? Is that where? You, um. Yeah. You're from, from Kalamazoo. The area. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you were from uh, out in West Michigan. I mean, Is Kalamazoo it, West Michigan? I thought so. Southwest Michigan. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Plainwell. Which oh, is okay. exit 49. Sorry, I'm a transplant here, so. Yeah, right. No worries. Yeah, so. I, when I think of West Michigan, I think of like Grand Haven. Ah. I guess that's more West Coast. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, to be fair, when I was in the Netherlands, I'd tell people I was from Detroit. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's all they knew. Yeah. Um, so what happens then? I mean, I'm, I'm what I'm really interested in hearing about mm-hmm. is where... Like where you went from then? You said you were doing general contracting, mm-hmm. so working for a builder, yep. yeah, and then yep, and then involved in the youth group at our church, like okay. discipling high school guys. How did you find a church when you got back? Uh, I was already plugged into a church before I left. Oh, you were? Yeah, okay. I was just more committed to. Is that it. the same church you're at now? No, no. Oh, okay. Would, yeah. No. Okay. They're uh, they so um, yeah they've moved much more charismatic and seeker friendly. Okay. Uh, which I saw at the time mm-hmm. and was trying to say this is a bad idea. Yeah. Like uh, like in the leadership meetings, they were talking about we're too focused on doctrine. We need to be more inviting to people. I was like, oh, it's a really bad idea. That's not going to go good. So uh, you were a part of those leadership meetings? N- no, I just talked to uh, a number of people who were in them. I see. Wow. Which maybe was a bad idea on their part. To talk afraid. to you. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of people that probably listen to this podcast that are in similar predicaments. Mm-hmm. I know that we were, when we moved back here from England just a year and a half ago, is we've... Huh. Welcome w- to the winning side. Yeah, thank you. We had a... 1776 <clears throat> reference. <laughs> We had a hard time finding a church. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a whole nother story, but um, we'd be at, sometimes we'd be at a church for a month or even two and, and feel the drift mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. Or we would be like, wait a minute. You know, we, we weren't privy to those leadership discussions. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I don't think it's hard to tell. Yeah. But um, there was also always that question in our minds do we stay and be the voice for what, where we think, what we think is more biblical Mm -hmm. and what is more true to like God's vision for the church? Or do we find another church? Mm -hmm. It's a really hard discussion to have when you're, you just feel like you're floating out at sea and Mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard on the kids going to different churches. So can you, Tell a little bit more about that process for you. Yeah. I mean, was it drawn out or were you like, some people are no, like, it's gonna oh, be, I'm out. No, it's annoying. Like next Sunday, I'm yeah. going to a different church. And other yeah. people stick around for years even. Yeah. Or they're like, okay, now I have to go. Yeah. So uh, and I don't, sorry to interrupt. I don't actually know of any examples and maybe you have some um, of where someone or a few people have helped turn a church around mm-hmm. be like, nope, let's bring it back around people. Yeah, I don't know that I do either. Um, but, um, yeah. Although, yep. on the phone, didn't she mention that the church you're at now has recently adopted the 1689? Um, moving towards that way. Yeah. Okay, you're moving that direction. Yeah. We're becoming, yeah, more con- confessional. If you can become more confessional, yeah. Okay. I don't know. I yeah. think you either are or you aren't. A lot of right. us would like to be at the church. 
Okay. Do you think it will be successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. But um, yeah. Yes, I do. Sorry. Was the? Can you remind me of the previous question? I don't remember it. So it was about the church before I went to uh, seminary. Oh right, so right. That was my solution: was move away and go to seminary. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. To, kind of a cheat. Never had to. Versus, I never actually thought through. Versus like things. looking for another church in the Kalamazoo area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, I'm sure you did that at the same time. Yeah. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Okay. No, because um, because uh, I think in my mind I had made a commitment, um, and I still talk to some of these high school guys uh, semi regularly. Um, yeah. Um, but no, I was committed to following through with the school year with those kid uh, kids. I think they're only like six years younger than me, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I was thinking it's something I'd figure out after the fact. But in between then, so the as it was the Puritans actually that kind of led me to want to apply to seminary because when I moved back, a lot of my friends in crew were reaching out saying, hey, can you come help us with whatever? We have no one who's helping us know how to do evangelism or no one's really helping us to understand these things in the Bible. Oh, wow. So I would meet yeah. with them. I would say, hey, you should read these guys. Okay. They would text me back. I have no idea what these guys are saying. And then uh, that was kind of the, like, I think I'm smart enough to understand what they're saying. Okay, interesting. But I'm not too smart where I can't talk to normal people. Yeah. It's like, do you know Vern Poitras from Westminster? Yes. Uh, I think he is too smart to communicate <laughs> with the average lay person. <laughs> Can I share a really funny, I think yeah, it's a yeah, funny yeah. story yeah. about him. Um, which I'm not trying to, uh, it's not meant to be mean, but I think it's hilarious. Um when I got to Westminster during their welcome week, I read, I read Greg Bonson's dissertation and had a bunch of questions. So I was like at the picnic, I was asking professors, people that look like professors, like, hey, are you a professor here? Because I have some questions about this thing. Okay. And they would, they would say, oh, you need to talk to either Dr. Oliphant or Dr. Poitras. Finally found Dr. Poitras, uh, explained that I read his dissertation and that I had a couple questions asked him my questions, and he goes, oh, those are really good questions. Let me think for a moment. And then as he's thinking, his wife comes over and goes, Vern, the Chick-fil-A line just opened. He turns around and walked away. <laughs> I never got an answer from him. <laughs> but I think he is someone that's too smart to talk to normal people. He, re he writes all, his, like all the books that he puts up. He, I, th I believe, tries to write at a, for the lay person, but mm -hmm. I think it's... Uh, uh, probably at a higher reading level yeah. than the lay person. Yeah. But I think it's just because he's too smart. Yeah. I definitely am not that smart. I can talk to people <laughs> <laughs> who don't have an MDiv. Yeah. So you, you acknowledge that in yourself there was something that was able to access this this these writings, yeah. this deeper theology, mm -hmm. but also be able to communicate it to People who yeah, might college not. kids at that point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All oh, right. So and so I want to go to seminary to learn that theology. Yeah. That apparently was like unaccessible to the normal person, because yeah, you know, my friends seem to yeah not be able to. Which, to be fair, unabridged John Owen. It's less about the theology that's hard to read. Yeah. But I don't yeah. know. I, I guess I wasn't smart enough to understand that at the time. <laughs> Yeah, so I just wanted to go to seminary to learn more so I could articulate it to, um, in the way I thought about it was articulate it in more dumbed down words for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like normal people. Why PRTS? Sorry, Westminster. Oh, sorry, that's right. You did Westminster first. Yep. Okay. To do an MDiv. Yep. Okay. Did you have any specialization there or was just kind of the general uh, MDiv I thing? ended in counseling, but... Um, yeah. And so why counseling? That seems yeah. a bit different. Well, I actually went there. Originally, I wanted to get a PhD in apologetics uh -huh. with Dr. Oliphant. Okay. Um, because by that point, I had already stumbled on Van Til and I'd read through A Defense of the Faith. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, man, this is what I want to do. Because apologetics was also, I think, pretty um, important in coming to faith yeah even if it was apologetics i think is bad now um or you know, I don't know if bad's the right word but bad yeah um and then found out as i was 
so that was one train. I was just starting to read Van Til, uh, reading Puritans, wanting to go to seminary so I could learn more to articulate, to help people who uh, would maybe have a harder time reading uh, headier stuff. So um, I, th I believe I put like 40 hours of research into seminaries. Uh, and um, in doing the research, I was trying to like look up how do you pick a seminary. Mm -hmm. And I, I have no idea. I don't remember at all what website it was, but someone was talking about it's important to consider do you want to go to a confessional school or an uh, ecumenical school? Yeah. And yeah. I was like, I don't know what those things are. So I looked them up. Okay. It was like confessional, like they have a really set standard. Yeah. I did not know at the time confessional referred to the Reformed Confessions. I just thought it was just a phrase of like, yeah. this school has particular beliefs that they teach. These yeah. other schools have a wide variety of views. Yeah. Um, and with that, became convinced, wanted to go to confessional because uh, I think it's a Jaya Packer quote that talks about in Knowing God, I think he talks about um, like the deeper you study into a particular subject, like it, don't recall the language he uses exactly, but it essentially like makes you like smarter. It like mm -hmm. expands your mind and your thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think he applies it to any subject. To like yeah. the deeper you understand a subject, like you have to work harder at it. Uh, and so I was pretty convinced I wanted to learn one system of thinking really well, not a surface level of a bunch of different systems of thought. Um, so I'd had. Uh, five schools like that were kind of that I was looking at um, the master seminary was one of them but um, then I was trying to figure out oh what's the difference between these schools I was like oh dispensational and covenant it's like I don't know that I'm covenant but I know I'm not dispensational so I kind of wrote that one off yeah but then realized Van Til used to teach at Westminster and once I realized that I was like oh that's a done deal which by the way Westminster is still the only school that I've ever applied for which really? I think is funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because when I went to Western, I was a, a, a dual enrolled in high school, mm -hmm. so I was already a student at Western before I graduated high school. So I didn't actually oh, have to apply; right. I could just enroll in more classes. Uh -huh. And then the PRTS was kind of a fluke as well. So, so you didn't. You didn't. I was going to say. So you didn't actually apply to PRTS. No, I don't think the program I'm in is uh, 100 percent official yet. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It. It has to do with biblical counseling, though, yeah, right? Yeah, doctor okay. in ministry and biblical counseling, but I think I'm, like, piloting it. <clears> that was what I was told. Yeah. We'll see in a couple of years what yeah. happens. But yeah. How are you enjoying PRTS? I do like it a lot. Right. Um, I don't... Uh, I prefer to stick with the ESV and leave it in the positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know as far as that goes. Um, also, uh, I think it's really fun being around a bunch of Dutch people because I still, uh, I told Judith, um, but uh, do you know any Dutch? I'd imagine probably not. No. Before I learned to ask someone how they were, a friend of mine taught me this phrase, which is still like the best phrase I can, uh, the phrase I can articulate the best in Dutch. But thank you, Vanda, double predestinatie leer. What do you think of double predestination? Day one in country, someone taught me that phrase, and I still remember it. But did you ask Judith? Yeah, as a joke. What'd she say? She asked me what I thought. <laughs> 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 but yeah, that's funny. She would do that. But yeah, it's fun talking to um, like Adrian Neely, Dutch mm -hmm. guy. Yeah, I just I think it's fun to try to remember some of the Dutch that I learned and talk. Yeah, in Dutch. Yeah, but I don't remember a lot. The other phrase I know really well is that I don't know much Dutch. What's the focus at PRTS in your, if it is a pilot program yep. or whether or not it is. So when we bring together reformed confessional theology mm -hmm. with biblical counseling, well, let's just call it counseling. Sure. How does that work? Uh, I think the better question is if you're considering who man is, apart from Reformed theology, I would wonder how in the world is that going to work? 
Mm-hmm. I think that's a better question. So, yeah, ex- ex- if you elaborate on that. Yeah, if you don't have a correct <clears throat> understanding of who people are, right, but psychology, right, the psyche, the soul, if you're trying to interact with man on a soul level and have no understanding of who man is or an incorrect understanding of man, I don't know how you expect counseling to work at that point. Well, let's talk, let's talk about counseling then. What, sure. What's the ultimate... Um, What's the purpose of counseling? What are you trying to accomplish mm-hmm. in that person? Yeah. Uh, well, I just want to build up. Uh, what am I trying to accomplish in that person? Help them to be, um, to grow. I'll put it maybe under the Ephesians 4, 17, the um, building up the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a form of personal ministry of the word, building yeah. up the body. Building up the body. But mm-hmm. that's... But you're meeting not with the whole, you're not counseling Correct. the whole church yep. together. Yep. So you're, you're just doing individuals or perhaps married couples. Yep. Um, but how like, does uh, that build up the body? Yeah, it's like CCF, right? Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with them, but they yeah. uh, reference the one another, the commands that are to one another mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just, I think, kind of that. But you're saying, how does it help to build up the body? So, well, there's the individual and then yeah. there's the corporate. Yeah, so hopefully, um, so, and it, I don't know if it's just the way my mind works or what, but probably two-thirds of the people I counsel, we end up talking about assurance of salvation. Oh, um, really? Mm-hmm. Okay, even mm-hmm. though that's not the issue they Correct. came in to talk to you Correct. about. <laughs> the, I have had one person come to me specifically to talk about assurance. Yeah, no one else. Mm. It's kind of an odd mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. but um, And why is that? why is that? so prevalent in your counseling that issue uh, i think um what do you think yeah so um i think i tend to be like a radical thinker in like the literal sense of like to the root so like as i'm talking to them about what the issues are that they want help with mm-hmm. and i'm trying to understand it um so i actually side note i mentioned earlier i wanted to get a phd in apologetics yeah i think uh, apologetics and counseling is the same skill mm. in two different arenas, but um, but I can explain that later. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I'm trying to understand, like the person, what they're struggling with, what their thoughts are, that kind of thing, um, it, we just regularly get back to. Some, they'll end up saying, "I'm just not sure I'm actually saved," or "I mm-hmm. don't know that the Lord actually loves me." Those types of things, and. Mm. Um, Maybe it's just the types of questions I ask. I don't know, but we yeah. just the conversations just go there pretty regularly. Yeah. But I do think in Hebrews, uh, I don't remember what chapter it is. Uh, I think six, but I'll love a fact check on that. Uh, talks about um, uh, wanting you to, uh, to the yeah the author talks about pers- pursuing assurance. Each one need to seek the same level of assurance that you might not be sluggish, something like that. But it ties like a assurance of salvation to like kind of a sluggishness, sluggishness of our faith. Mm. And so, you know, if people are becoming more confident in their walk with the Lord, more confident, have some sort of some form of assurance. Um, well, in uh, J.C. Raw, Holiness and Practical Religion, yeah, uh, in his chapter on assurance, has an analogy of when the West was being settled. If two people get an equal um, size uh, plot of land, have about equal um, skill, I guess, in tilling it, one of them is assured the land is his, the other one doubts, and so regularly drives into town to double check that the land is his. He kind of put, like just poses that question, who's going to work the land more? Mm. And it's the guy who stays there and works, not mm. the guy who goes and questions. Interesting. Um, so, okay. yeah, I mean, I think if... Uh, more Christians have are not and I'm not to be clear, I'm not trying to say that like I can give them assurance, but I can point them to the proper grounds of their assurance, which isn't um I still sin, therefore I don't think I'm a Christian. Right. Which I actually uh I think it's funny. Um that the a uh, friend of mine who came to talk about assurance, the kind of thing that clicked in him was he was saying he was comparing himself to other believers and saying like oh they're just way more mature than me and eventually uh, i'm not gonna say his name but i was like bro 
Do you realize you're spiritually pro-choice? He's like, what do you mean? It's like, you're sitting here saying you haven't matured enough, therefore you're not alive. That's not how life works. Mm-hmm. The only way to get any type of maturity is for there to be life in the first place. Right. You, don't, you don't look at the level of maturity to determine whether or not that's life. Right. But that's what he was doing. Yeah. And when I said that to him, he's like, you're right. And yeah, he, he's still a, a fun guy or an odd <laughs> duck, but um, yeah, has a lot more confidence in his relationship with the Lord. And it's really helped him mm-hmm. in a number right. of areas. Besides scripture, mm-hmm. are there any particular resources that you're constantly making re- recourse to, whether or not your counseling knows it? Yep, three. Uh, Antinomianism by Mark Jones. Reform okay. Antinomianism, I think the subtitle is uh, Reformed Theology's Unwelcome Guest. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Untangling Emotions by Alistair J. Groves. Uh, and Indwelling Sin and Believers. Why, why those three? Mm. Um, so the untangling emotions by Alistair J. Groves, um, which is kind of funny. He's the director of CCF, knowing, uh, CCF, the, and he's the guy that got me, convinced me to go into counseling. Um, but um, I think you prefer a little more backstory in this format. Yeah, is it? Yeah. Do you have a preference? Yeah. yeah. Um, so before I was a Christian just did whatever I felt like doing, became a Christian, realized my emotions were not correct all the time, which was a new phenomenon for me. So you you realized that you needed to choose your emotions? Mm-mm. No, I just decided to not trust them anymore and okay. just tried to ignore them for a long time. So instead of controlling them, mm-hmm. you decided... I just tried to ignore them. It's how you reacted to having emotions. I, I tried to not have emotions, yeah. That's the way I would say it. Really? Yeah. A lot of people do it. Not have emotions? You, yeah, you try to, yeah. I mean, or you ignore them. I mean, um, interesting. I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but there is a little bit of a caricature about Reformed folk being called the Frozen Chosen. You've heard that? Yeah. 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 yeah it's a. But not all Reformed folk I, are Frozen. I totally agree. Correct. I agree. I'm just saying it's a caricature uh, that. I think John Owen would very much disagree with I, you, knowing how he preached. Or am I thinking of Knox? Not all of them would. But yeah, the- <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm saying I did think that at one point because I realized they lied to me, like my emotions were lying. Okay. Right? I felt like doing something I knew was wrong. And so I just, I'm just, um, but that was also when I was starting to become more uh, convinced of God's sovereignty. Mm-hmm. And I had a misunderstanding that I think a lot of people do, that um, the way I used to put it, which is bad and wrong, to be clear, was if my sister were to die and I was sad, that meant I was not trusting the Lord Mm. because he knows what's best. So if that's what he decides and I'm upset, I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that was, uh, um, yeah, I think emotionally we're responsible for the revealed things. Yeah. In uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. We don't have to talk about this, but sure. um, has this led you to think about things like divine simplicity? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, did, I said we don't have to go there. I don't care. <laughs> Dr. Oliphant was my advisor at okay. the time he got in some trouble yeah. over a book. Uh-huh. And the guy that brought him up on charges was a TA in one of the classes I was taking at the same time. Oh, interesting. That was Mr. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was like the most recent controversy at Westminster. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There during that time. It's kind of fun. No, you weren't just there. You were involved in it in some way. I mean, I knew people involved in it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I got to ask Sinclair Ferguson his thoughts on the oh, topic. Okay. Which that's actually another kind of funny story. Yeah. That um, um, I had Sinclair in Doctrine of Christ mm-hmm. for the Doctrine of Christ class, and I made an appointment to speak with him. Ask to ask him this question because, like, we learned, um, like, Dr. Oliphant taught our um, uh, Doctrine of God class mm-hmm. um, with the covenantal properties concept. I don't know how familiar you are with that. That's okay. Uh, do you want me to explain it or just move on? I don't care. Sure. Uh, actually, is it okay to not explain it in case I miss explain it? Let's move on. Okay. Um, but anyway. That was what he was getting in trouble for, with okay. some of the ways he articulated that, yeah. 
which is why I was saying I prefer not to in case I articulate sure. it wrongly. Yeah, I understand. But I wanted to ask Sinclair Ferguson what he thought. Okay. Uh, so the day my appointment was after class was the day Westminster closed down for COVID. <laughs> I didn't get to ask him. <laughs> but it's kind of a better reason than Chick-fil-A line being open. Like yeah, with I guess. Thress. Yeah. Yeah. But I did get to have an uh, online meeting with him like a couple months later and he was back in Scotland. Okay. Were you satisfied with Sinclair's answer? answer? Mm-hmm. He, um, so this, this is a direct quote from someone that I'm also not going to mention um, their name, but the idea that uh, when scripture talks about us going from being an object of wrath to no longer being one, it's not talking about it. It's not a direct quote. I'm sorry. It, it is not a direct quote, but some of these are correct words. Yeah. I could pull it up if you'd like. No, no, it's it, fine. But it's fine. that scripture is not talking about an actual change in the relationship between us and the Lord. Otherwise, that would necessitate a change in the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's talking about our perceived relationship. Mm -hmm. So we, it, it's talking about a change where we perceive ourselves from being under wrath to perceiving ourselves to being under grace, but there's no actual change that happens. Mm -hmm. I think Ferguson said he does not like that way of saying things, but it's probably not a good idea to dive too deeply into mm. how all those things work out. Wise answer. I thought so too. Yeah. And I was the only person he was talking to, so he wasn't saying it just to not get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like that answer. Yeah. Because, I, yeah, I have a hard time with the idea that, I think it's the Thomas Aquinas, the pillar mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, I don't I don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. Aquinas is another one that we could get into, but that's uh, kind of a hot topic right now, too. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'd rather talk about Star Wars. and <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I really don't like the movies. I think they're not good. Well, let's let's kind of finish this out with some, um, some discussion about homeschooling. Mm-hmm. And uh, you mentioned Vody Bauckham earlier. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get him on the show at some point. We'll definitely work on that. Um, yeah, if you could let me know when that is, I'd be happy to come by and grab some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> come on up. Yeah. Um, so, you, was, so you and your wife, uh, that was a conscious decision you guys made to homeschool early on? Or is this uh, not early relatively on. new? Yeah, so um, uh, so I think it's funny, and I'm happy to leave it alone, or you can ask more questions. Uh. But I met my wife through our son when he was three at a Joel Beakey conference. You met your wife yeah. through our your son. son? Yeah. She yeah, was that's... married before, and uh -huh. her husband died the same week. They were going to Mars Hill. Her husband died the same week Mars Hill closed. Which okay, was a really bad week for her. No, I'm glad you said this because Good when you when you sent me a little bit of like yeah. prep, yeah. it said met wife and son. Yeah. And I was like, huh? And I was like, oh, he just means he met his wife and they had a son. Nope. No, he introduced us. Yeah. Titus. How did he was three? Tell me about the it introduction. Was the preaching conference at Westminster, Joel Beakey was preaching. Uh huh. Which I haven't said to him, but I have spoken to him a couple of times about okay. different things. But okay. it'd be fun to mention him at some point. Yeah. Uh, but she showed up for chapel, which is yeah. what they normally did. Yeah. And we all had name tags on. Yeah. And he walked up and read my name. And I just started talking to him. Yeah. And then he, and then what's his name? Titus. And then Julie came up because she was wondering where her son went. And then we started talking. Yeah. And then found out that uh, I knew more about Mark Driscoll than she did, even though she <laughs> went to his church. So that's the Driscoll connection. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yep. But, um, yeah, but we actually went, sent him to a um, private school mm -hmm. uh, at first. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, by the time he was five, like like our kids can read. Like our three year old can, I mean, she's reading like little, like Bob books or whatever. They're like three, four letter words, but yeah, like they can all read. Start to read by three. By yeah. five, they can all read chapter books. Um, yeah. And he was getting in trouble at school because. The word of the week for reading was ah, okay. like the letter A, but yeah. the word ah. And he was just getting in trouble because he was bored. And then um, we decided to try homeschooling and started to, my wife first, but started to read about classical education. Mm -hmm. And then I started to read more about it too. And mm -hmm. um, also around that time, 
though, um, was when I was starting to hear. So that would have been, I think, 2017. But um, And that was on the east side in the Philadelphia area. But there were some schools around there that were starting to, um, well, I don't know, better to say, it was starting to be reported that um, if a boy identified as a girl on a sleepover and spent the night with the girls and a parent who was there told other parents that parent could be criminally charged and we're like, there's no way we're sending our kids into this. Mm-hmm. So so public schools at that point were off the table Yeah. Um, in our minds. Uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, so we tried Christian private school and yeah, I kept getting in trouble for, I think I've also become more convinced that the sitting sitting down in a class for a long time is really not geared towards little boys very well. Yeah. But yeah, then reading about classical education, well, to be more accurate, classical Christian education, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we both um, are convinced that is best, not that it's the only appropriate option, but right. best. And homeschooling then provides the flexibility to teach the kids. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, more, um, not that I like the word individual, but more appropriate to each kid. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but like for now, uh, our 12-year-old, excuse me, um, like he, which I thought was really cool. At 12, he came to us and said that he wanted more freedom to be responsible for his own work. And so this year we're not focused on his school work with him, but we're focused on him growing and being responsible. And oh, learning to, yeah. the way we talk with him about it is like, it was a good week, not if you get your work done, but if you're growing and being more faithful. Hmm. If you're growing and being more faithful and you didn't get your work done, I don't really care. 20 years from now, if you're continuing to grow and being faithful, you'll get your work done. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. I'd, and this is, this is, I think I mentioned this earlier with my wife, but that's been a hard shift for her. Um, was, okay. Okay. Uh, hard shift for her in terms of um, uh, she often has a hard time remembering the goal is not just to accomplish his work. Right. Uh, but she's definitely come around to that and agrees, but it's just still a challenge. Yeah. But I think, um, yeah, like if, if he gets his work done uh, and is not growing as like a godly man, that's a pretty bad trade if you mm-hmm. had to pick one. Mm-hmm. Not that I do think you have to pick one, but mm-hmm. I do think if getting your work done is the goal, being a godly man can easily fall to the wayside. Yeah. If being a godly man is the yeah. goal, he'll end up getting his work done. Yeah. And so I think helping her to see that and prioritize like that. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to help him mature. Um, yeah, and learn to be faithful. He'll end up getting more work done in the long run, but that's not the primary goal. Yeah. I'd rather have him be a faithful believer. Yeah. And like he's I don't know, he's he's a super smart kid. So uh how do you measure faithfulness? Like I um yeah. What are you, what are the things mm-hmm. you're looking at? Because it's yeah. easy to look at a math assignment. Oh, it's done and it's correct. Sure. Yeah. So um uh I think this is correct, but in some sense I think uh, I've not heard anyone else refer to things in this manner. So I am reformed enough to know that's not good territory to be on, right? Uh, but my understanding of Second Corinthians 8, 12, it says if the readiness is there, sorry, this is ESV, so. Uh, You're good. Some have translated it <laughs> wrongly to say if the readiness is there, it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what they do not have. Okay. Context is money. Um, but I think there's a broader principle that our job is to be faithful with what we have, not faithful with what we don't have. Mm. We understand that inherently when it comes to money. No one thinks that someone making $20,000 a year should be giving $30,000, for example. We, we understand it inherently with money, but I don't think we apply that principle more broadly, but I think we ought to. Um, so, for example, it's been super helpful with my wife who used to get like pretty distraught, uh, upset, um, feel a bit like a failure if one of the kids was sick and she didn't get through the lesson plan for the day. Mm. What I would try to be Mm -hmm. encouraging her with is you're trying to be faithful with the day that you weren't given. 
our goal as Christians yeah. is to be faithful with the day that we were actually given. Yeah. Um, same thing with I was talking to a woman in our church yesterday <laughs> morning who was just feeling pretty upset that she walked kind of away from the church for 30 years and doesn't know her Bible that well. Um, and I was trying to encourage her with, like, you're, like, I don't think the standard of perfection is already done with, with Christ. That's given. Uh, we're already in the family, if you will. Um, so I was trying to help her with, like, I don't think the Lord actually holds you to the standard as if you hadn't walked away from the church for 30 years. I think the standard the Lord holds, holds you to is today you have the level of knowledge mm-hmm. you do. Mm-hmm. How do you make use of that well? Yeah. And how do you be faithful with that well? Yeah. Um, the analogy I like to use is the, um, like when a kid's wa- learning to walk, no one yells at them because they fall down. You cheer for them because they took steps. I do think, based on um, antinomianism by Mark Jones, that was one of my big takeaways, is I think that's actually the attitude the Lord has to us, is that he's pleased because the faith that he has given us is actually working its way out in our lives. Right. Not that it's perfected right. in this life, but the perfected the standard of perfection is already taken care of because of Christ. Mm-hmm. So I think it's the... Um, that he's trying, that my son is trying to. And the big thing I'm working on with him lately is, are you trying to do your work as a Christian? Okay. Not just are you trying to work hard. Like consciously. Yep. Karim Deo. Yeah. Yep. Karim Deo. Uh, sorry. Yes. I don't That's actually I know Latin. Say. Okay. <laughs> I think I mispronounced it. It is on my list to learn Latin because there's a couple of books I want to read that are only in Latin. But I did use uh, ChatGTP to translate one of them. I just haven't read it yet. <laughs> Be careful of that translation. I know, but <laughs> it's better than Latin for me um, to understand at least. Yeah, so right, doing the work as a Christian, that's what yeah. I want him to grow in. And so long, yeah. in my mind right now, he's 12. As long as he's trying, I'm pretty content. Mm-hmm. I think for a 12-year-old to be thinking about how do I do work actually as a Christian, consciously before the presence of the Lord, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty content that our 12 year olds thinking about those things. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I don't really care if his math gets, well, kind of, because then we get to play video games if his math's done. Uh, if his math isn't done, I don't get to play with him. Yeah. 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 But at the end of the day, I care more about the other thing. Um, are you and your wife both involved in the homeschooling? Um, to varying degrees. Like yeah. the teaching aspect. Yeah. Well, um, Kind of, but only because um, like the business thing that I mentioned earlier when I was asking you about being a broker. Um, s- soon-ish, probably after I finish the papers that I got to write for my classes, um, he's going to be coming with me to uh, do work on the rental properties, which he actually helped me fix it up. Um, but he's going to be coming with me regularly to learn how to, we do short-term rentals. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Well, I said that plural. We have a short-term rental in mm-hmm. South Haven. Mm-hmm. Um, but my goal is by the time he's 16 that I'll have gone with him enough that he'll know how to do it. Right. And then I told him I'd buy him a car to work for me. Yep. And he'll just yep. go do that when I want him to. That's yep. the idea. We'll see how that goes. But it's Good motivation. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was actually really cool that that was his decision. I offered to buy him um, a Nintendo Switch mm-hmm. after helping me fix the house. Or I said, or if you keep working for me when you're in, when you're 16, I'll buy you a car instead. And he said that I think it's better for me to learn delayed gratification. I'd rather get the car hmm. at 16. Wow. So I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I wouldn't have said that at 12. <laughs> <laughs> I'd barely say that now. Neither would I. Yeah. Does he do jiu-jitsu with you? Yeah, except he broke his collarbone. So he's oh, got to no. wait for that to do. Doing jiu-jitsu? Uh, no. Okay. Pretending to play a video game with his cousin. They were acting out a video game. <laughs> he was the bad guy, got shot, fell down, broke mm-hmm. his collarbone. Mm-hmm. Pretty lame. Yeah. How long have you two been doing jiu-jitsu together? Mm, three, three months maybe. Oh, Not very long. recently. Yeah. I'm asking because I'm actually going today with my son for the first time to do jiu-jitsu together. I think it's great. Really? Yeah. He, my son's 14. Okay. He's autistic, high-functioning. Um, organized team sports have been a challenge, mm-hmm. especially because 
there's only one coach for like all those kids. Sure. And he, he definitely needs a bit more of like mm -hmm. attention. Sure. So I don't know. I thought maybe this will be good for him. Yeah. I love it. And me. Yeah. Well, and, um, I guess your kids are a bit older, but our, my kids ask me to wrestle every time I walk through the living room. Yeah. And so like having some organization to that where they can actually learn some type of skill. Yeah. Um, and that, like uh, the gym we go to has a pretty good family rate where you pay a certain amount and then your whole family gets to go. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we cut the cost per person down quite a bit with yeah. our family. Yeah. Um, so I was part of it too. Yeah. So what's what's next for you? You're um, you're finishing up at PRTS or are you, is this pilot program you're doing still fairly new? Yeah, it's fairly new. I'm about af after January if I actually get the papers done. Which yeah. so far I've never missed a paper, but okay. yeah, I've never been in a car accident either. <laughs> Still time, but then I'll be halfway done. Halfway done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how much longer do you think it'll take you to finish? Two years. And what's the goal after that? What's going to um, change about your career and mm -hmm. life? Yeah. So, um, cause you currently work as a biblical counselor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, so, uh, right, so it's a doctorate in ministry, not a PhD, so I don't have to write a, like, mm -hmm. a dissertation. Yeah. Um, the project that I was asked to do was to develop a class on an anthropology class, which I do actually prefer the term doctrine of man. I think I heard R.C. Sproul talk about it, where anthropology is more a uh, secular term. Doctrine of man is mm -hmm. more, but mm -hmm. that's okay. Um, okay. Uh, and develop the cl the class to be a doctorate of ministry level class mm -hmm. uh, to potentially teach at Puritan in the future. Oh wow! So that's what I'd like to do. Yeah, teach. Part well, well part time like, yeah. teach and yeah. counsel. Yeah, yeah, and okay. uh, work on the houses, the rentals. Yeah, and if I can do it on top of that, after that, go to law school. But oh, that's another. Okay, that's just if I. I I think it's good to have goals that you don't accomplish. That's better than not having goals and then accomplishing all of them. I think. Yeah. 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 I have a few of those. It's the question every day, isn't it? It's like, how do I do all the things that I want to do um, as a dad, as a husband, mm -hmm. as a man? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks. That, that's that been helpful for me. Yeah. Because I have too many things. I've, I can't do all the things I want to do. Yeah. Well, and I think that's okay. Good. I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's the same thing with the Second Corinthians 8.12. Just, right? I don't think we're responsible to do everything by any means, mm -hmm. just to be faithful with what we have. Mm -hmm. And right now I don't have the ability to learn Latin on top of what I'm doing. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. If one day I have the time to do that, I'll learn Latin and be able I to check chat GTP on its translation. <laughs> I think you'd enjoy it. Latin is a good language. Yeah, my kids are learning it. Yeah, yeah. There's actually, I know this is probably dumb, but I've thought about at some point I could probably pay my kid to translate it for me. <laughs> the, yeah. the logical brain of Nick Kellogg again. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, sorry, with the, with uh, I mentioned the, him going to the help me with the rentals. Mm -hmm. So, like, now that he's older, I'm kind of taking more of a um, role in his education. Oh, I see. So, like, my wife okay. is kind of laying the foundation. Right. So, like, the life stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. like, I got a couple audiobooks to listen to with him for mm -hmm. when we're driving because it's a 45 minute drive, mm -hmm. but help him to think more broadly because I do think education is primarily limited to academics. Yes. And it, it shouldn't be. We should teach our kids how to handle money like Christians. We mm -hmm. should teach them how to think about their careers like Christians, mm -hmm. which could mean go from high school to college and get a job. Yeah. But it doesn't have to. Yeah. 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 Which I don't want our kids to go, but that's that's okay. To college I'm saying. Yeah. It's becoming sorry, it's becoming more expensive sorry. and it's becoming less valuable and that does that's like a Yeah, exactly. trend that doesn't work very long. Well, maybe some and I think there are a handful, a few places that might still be worth sending yeah. kids to. I agree in a few degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Not a few. There's more than a few. There are degrees that are worth it. There are degrees, but there are institutions that are worth it, but they're, they're, sure. very, they're very few. Yep. Yeah. But I would also rather have, have our kids um, 
be raising a family and working before going to school. Because mm-hmm. I think, um, yeah, like when I went to college, I didn't have an appreciation for education. Yeah. I just did it because that's what I was supposed to. Yeah. You know, it was a big waste of money. Yeah. I mean, the Lord used it for sure. But yeah. yeah. Well, Nick, it's been really good having you on here. Yeah. I enjoyed you. having a conversation that went many different ways <laughs> and directions. Yeah. I really enjoyed finding these toothpicks again. And I am going to go buy a box of these. That one's right. had devoid of flavor now. So uh, we've had a nice long conversation. I'm really, it's exciting to hear what you're doing. Um, I mean, we should get get you back on here at some point to talk deeper about just biblical counseling sure. because I know that's a big topic that for some people in the church can be a bit divisive, um, but I think it's just so, so important, mm-hmm. especially as someone who's in a family that has people with mental health and whatnot. But um, yeah, man, I'm glad you came up. Yeah, me it's too. It's really an yeah, honor uh, just getting to know you and... Thanks, man. Yeah. Good to have you up. Yep. Good to meet you and talk with you. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everyone.